the second day, I'm Giovanni Bellucci, one of the members of one of the editors of the HPA journals, History of Post War Architecture, who will chair the works in the second day of this conference. And I would like to start by going on on what uh, Luigi Bartolomei said yesterday, opening the first day. So, by showing you some pictures that will retrace the start of this journey that started in Bologna around 70 years ago. It was 1954, and especially in 1955, during which in September, we've had a set of very important initiatives that were very useful to weave a set of national and international relationship that we're going to see and that uh, will go on on the after that first uh, action and a set of exhibitions, the National Exhibition of Sacred Architecture and also a set of parallel events that were organized and probably Rui Luigi was right in organizing this in this area. So in Via Zamboni, Piazza Rossini, and the San Giacomo Church. Here is the pavilion that was built uh, very quickly and designed by a set of architects uh, that were appointed by Cardinal, Le Cardinal Lercaro with the creation of the new church's office. And then the setup of the uh, interior spaces of San Giacomo, you will see the different organization of religious uh, structures and here the nave, the central nave of the church was set up as the uh, headquarters of the international uh, Callis exhibition and then the uh, nearby uh, Santa Cecilia chapel as the exhibition of the sacred treasure of Bologna. The people from Bologna know these images very well, but it's always good to show them, to show this uh, beautiful colored picture. Then they were in this book, which isn't celebrated enough and which mm, marked the first decade of uh, building of churches in Italy, but which also had an opening to an important international context series, the, pav the pavilion once again, from uh, Via Zamboni, from the other side. And then the fourth part of the set of events, the part curated by uh, Griseri, he, he wasn't, he didn't graduate, he hadn't graduated yet. And this uh, table, this analysis of this research that were exhibited along uh, the lodge of uh, San Giacomo in Via Zamboni. And this is something I would like to underline, which is in continuity with what we've been doing today, the conference. So all these exhibitions were opened by a conference, a national conference, the first National Congress of Sacred Architecture, but which had a, an important international audience, which I'm going to describe. A three days conference, 23 to 25th September, 1955, in the Aula Magna of the University of Bologna, and the presence of Lercaro, you see in the small picture on the left, Cardinal Lercaro speaking with the rector of the University of Bologna, Professor Battaglia, and the plenary session in the uh, Aula Magna of uh, the university, and uh, a set of actions that range uh, that were mostly related to Italian architecture, but which had also an international insight here is Mies, uh, and, uh, and an image was shown yesterday, the church of the, at the Illinois Institute of Technology. So Le Corbusier obviously is a great presence here. And also the presentation of important elements. Yesterday we talked about the space, this famous uh, look at the internal space of the St. Peter's Church with a great work by Luigi Moretti in the space. And then I've put just some of the speakers of the conference and some attendees. And it's a, 
and it's interesting to see them today. What, the first thing I notice is the presence among the speeches after the uh, introduction by the rector and uh, by architect Gisleri, we had the presence of uh, highly esteemed uh, uh, characters. The first one was Gaston Bardet, the director of the International Institute of Urban Planning. And also Zevi was there. The, he was the director, he was a great representative of the National Institute of uh, Urban Planning. Luigi Augustoni, director of the Lugano Pastoral Liturgy Center, representing all the uh, liturgical institutes all over the world, and then all over the world, and all the uh, Faculty of Architecture of Florence, Raffaello Fagnoni, Ludovico Quaroni, Roberto Papini. This is related to the fact that Grisle Grisleri was graduating in Florence, but Trebbi was there, who graduated some years before, so he was very much in contact with the faculty in Florence, and all these uh, uh, architects made a great presentation at this conference, and then we'll have the, the presentations by Trebi and Michelucci, and then there's a set of uh, academic people who were invited to attend to this three days conference. And it's interesting to see that the four uh, universities organizing the conference today are there, this Polonia University, Cambridge University, but British University were very well uh, represented, Aberdeen, Cork, Dublin. So uh, the uh, Anglo-Saxon world was very much present. And then University of Turin, the Polytechnical University of uh, Turin, who sent the Dean, Professor Caretti, and then Cavalieri Murat uh, made a speech. Then the University of Lisbon, who sent Professor Luis Bulton, who published several articles on uh, the urban rebuilding of uh, cities and the set of artists, many artists from Portugal. We talked about the relationship between architecture and art yesterday. And seeing the list of names, I saw Scott. Uh, Antonio Duarte, Joaquin Correra, the painter Antonio Lino, and many uh, architects, uh, freelancers, or uh, professors in the university, in the university, or also and also authors in the magazine by Virginia Pollini, among the most prominent and the greatest representatives of the main schools of architecture and engineering, both Italian and international. So I'd like to start from the uh, speeches I will coordinate. Salvatore Carolia from the University of Palermo, but also Monsignor Ottavio Mosumeci was there, the Bishop of Syracuse, then representatives from the Faculty of Architecture of Rome, Vincenzo Fasoli, you have of Venice, Giuseppe Samona. And from Florence, there was also uh, the Dean of the School of uh, Architecture, Achille Arcangeli, and then the schools of architecture and, and engineering from Germany, Hochschule in Graz and uh, Aachen, the Academy of Vienna, and Spain, which sent representatives from the School of uh, Architecture and Industrial Engineering from Barcelona. And this leads me to bring you the apologies of some representatives that couldn't be here, among which uh, Alba Arboi Alio, who was uh, supposed to present research on Barcelona architecture, and who together uh, with uh, Luigi Ma Emanuele Amabile and Alberto Calderon apologized because they couldn't be here. And I would like to conclude by saying Alba Arbo Ailio, together with Magda Maria Serrano, teachers at the School of Barcelona, sent, published a call, which will end uh, in 1st December, which is called the Religion, Public Schools and Society, which might be interesting both uh, to the participants and the guests of the conference. So it's a call for papers. So I would like to conclude giving the floor to the first keynote speaker of the day, Professor Esteban Fernandez-Corian, architect and full professor at the University of La Coruña, 
since the very beginning, his studies and his interests are based on sacred architecture, starting from his PhD, which he earned on a thesis on the sacred space, which has been published in uh, 2005. He's part of the jury of the International Prize sacred Architect of Sacred Architecture for of the Pavia. He's the, the editor of AIRC, and since 2013, he's coordinator of the International uh, Contemporary Legion Architecture um, Conference. Among his publications, so there is one uh, related to A Coruña, where he's a professor, and uh, also contemporary Spanish architecture, among which is a book recently published, the translation of an important text by Rudolf Schwarz, as has been quoted yesterday many times, published in very recently, along with an article from 2019, where he outlined this interesting relationship between Grisleri and the Ara uh, Journal, one of the Spanish journals that deal with church and neighborhoods, uh, highlighting this project of which we're going to talk today. Professor Cobian will uh, uh, make a keynote speech called Religious Architecture and Urban Planning in Vigo during uh, the time of Jose de, of Jose de Licado Baeza as bishop, 1969-1975. So it's uh, right after the years in which Lercaro was bishop here in Bologna. Professor, the floor to you. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni Bellucci. First of all, I would like to thank Luigi Bartolomei for his invitation to participate in this important event. And this gives me the opportunity to meet many colleagues. It's always a pleasure to come to Bologna, uh, visiting its historical university. My lecture today is has personal references because I'm going to talk about my birthplace, Vigo, and also because uh, uh, we are counting the first six years of life, even though I cannot introduce these uh, facts in my bio bi biography. So... I will follow the diagram that you have on the screen. The parochial division in the second half of the 20th century is, and the consequent uh, building of new cities has been a classic topic in the historiography of contemporary religious architecture. So the initiative taken uh, by Cardinal Lecalo in Bologna, Pellegrini in Turin and Montini in Milan are very uh, known in Spain, Morcillo in Madrid, Modrego in Barcelona, or Bishop Peralta in, in Vittoria Gasteiz, but also in Portugal and other European countries. Obviously, there are more, there are more interesting cases which will be uh, gradually known. Today, I would like to comment on the work carried out by Jose Delicado Baeza in the five years in which he uh, was uh, the bishop of the Spanish diocese of Tui Vigo between 1969 and 1975, a small ecclesiastic territory located in northwest Spain. In the city of Vigo, which reached 200,000 inhabitants, 14 new parishes were built, meeting the need of the growth of the city due to the one to the creation of one of the industrial development poles promoted during the government of General Frank and which would originate the so-called Spanish economic miracle and also the new social sensitiveness of the Catholic Church after the celebration of uh, the Second Vatican Council. 
The development of the city of Vigo is related to this um, marvelous uh, sea harbor whose depth made it the main starting point of the Spanish migration towards Americas at the beginning of the 20th century. Here, the big ships uh, embarking in a transoceanic route uh, called, like the one uh, leading Le Corbusier to Argentina at the end of 1929. The municipal area of Vigo has been modeled in the first half of the 20th century by the incorporation of the nearby municipalities of, of Bothas and Labadores. Right now, this municipality has a, has a unique structure made of three different areas, a rural area, which is scarcely transformed by the urban phenomenon, in where, where the old parochial uh, parish uh, fabric survives, a peri-urban area with a development based on the filling of the base parish structure and the urban area which has been formed by the aggregation of neighborhoods and parishes. Vigo still preserves a, a division in 18 parishes which is the trace of the old ecclesiastic division. This parish structure underwent many transformation over the last century, however, preserving some aspects while others were deeply transformed. In 1956, a new urban law, urban planning law, unified all the Spanish urban legislation, which was really uh, disintegrated by uh, systematizing planning. This led to a conceptual change in the urban criteria applied in Spain, in Spain up to that moment, since it made it possible to create new residential industrial areas through reserve grounds and address the development of plant growth uh, throughout uh, partial plants. Between 1964 and 1975, the general regulatory plans were approved of the main uh, Spanish cities, whose merging with the partial plans which were already ongoing originated uh, some amendments in the latter, especially concerning the provision of uh, structures which are also called complementary services. In 1953, Spain signed, Spain signed a new agreement with the Holy See, stating the confessional nature of the state and the full acknowledge of the Catholic ch Church. In this context, the places uh, of worship emerged as one of the complementary buildings envisaged by the uh, Housing National Institute. The decree now the decree uh, of 1962 on the building of religious building led to the second housing uh, plan for these kind of services. The purpose of the decree was to provide religious services in, uh, um, in towns in which at least 50% of the population was made of uh, houses subject to any regime of state protection. The places of worship could have been chapels or uh, parishes, parish centers, like this one in Santiago de Vigo. When Monsignore Delicado Baeza came to Vigo in 1969, the city didn't have a general planning. Only some sectoral planning tools were uh, enforced, allowing the city to keep growing. With these weak uh, instruments, the city had its main decade of growth, the 60s, and started the 70s with uncertain perspectives since it couldn't approve a general plan organizing all the stakeholders involved in the development. Antonio Ramilo 
became the mayor of Vigo in March 1970. Since the, since the very first moment, he promoted the drafting of the general regulatory plan that the team guided by Gaspar Blaine, an architect from Madrid, started to draft in 1961. The plan was published to public in summer 1970. Immediately, seven citizen organizations asked for an external technical report from the uh, professor from, Bar from Barcelona, Manuela Ribas Piera. The report was negative and it underlined that the repeated amendments of the plan during its drafting and the discrepancies and the differences among the uh, several actors to, um, compared to the uh, content generated a hybrid document without a comprehensive overview. Regardless of the clarity, the report wasn't taken into consideration by the municipality and on 7th January 1971, Vigo passed a new regulatory plan, which for many was a, uh, an unpleasant document. After the approval of the regulatory plan, 15 areas of action were uh, set in the urban reserve for the development of partial plans. Among these, 13 uh, were related to uh, the uh, terrains of urban parishes, leaving the rural and peri-urban parishes outside the urban development process. As a consequence, the majority, most of the, uh, the uh, municipal territory was not structured and the historical parish network was subject to a mildly regulated completion process and then went to uh, this dissolution. Uh, Okay, in that period, Pope Paul VI was working on the same issues. In the apostolic, uh, in the motto proprio apostolic letter Ecclesia Sancte of 1966, he recommended to divide or distribute the area of parishes in which due to the excessive number of uh, church goers, the excessive extension of territory or for any other reason, the apostolic activity was carried out uh, in an appropriate way and struggling. Then he would insist on the same topic with the Octogesima Advenience Apostolic Letter from on published on 1971, in which he, as a top priority, he dealt with the rebuilding of the social fabric in the cities, creating cultural interest centers that could favor not just the religious life, but also the human promotion or the simple relationship among the people. And I quote, it's urgent to rebuild uh, at the scale of the road, the neighborhood or the big community, the social fabric within which men and women can meet the needs, the right needs of their own personalities. End of quotation. In Spain, the Catholic hierarchy had the goal of drafting valid action lines for all the national territory, which would answer, which would meet the demand of religious structure generated by the new uh, planning of the cities in order to meet the needs of the growing urban society. The church therefore found itself uh, facing a huge challenge and a broad internal debate that was ongoing on many issues. The instruction to build uh, parish uh, centers, published in 1965, dealt with the construction, the building of uh, churches from different perspectives. The 
Technical Office of Religious Sociology of the Archbishop of Madrid, Alcalá, directed by the sociologist Jacinto Rodriguez Osuna, was uh, renovating, uh, was carrying out a complex renovation of the diocese for which more than 300 new churches would have been needed. In front of this great endeavor, Archbishop Casimiro Morcillo asked the religious orders to commit in the parish action, an initiative that, as we will see, would be also carried out by Delicado Baeza during the uh, renovation, the parish renovation in the diocese of uh, Tui Vigo in 1970. Obviously, while the church was increasing the number of parish uh, of parishes, they had to provide them with new buildings that could host their uh, functions. The Second Vatican Council ratified the currents coming from the liturgical movement, asking for the progressive incorporation of the faithful to the rituals and the apostolic responsibilities beyond the simple participation to the Sunday Mass. This led to a radical uh, change in the way of conceiving churches, paving the road to a set of typological innovations. Parish centers have evolved from independent temples to multifunctional compounds in which the church re, uh, rethought its own uh, relationship from power to service with an increasingly pluralist society. José Delicato Baeza was 42 when he was appointed as the Bishop of Tui Vigo. He was born in the Mancha, like Don Quixote. He carried out ecclesiastic studies in Malaga and Salabanca. He was ordered priest in 1951. He became teacher at the high school, curator of the uh, parish in Albacete, and uh, uh, diocesan counselor of workers' movements. In 1952, he was appointed as the canonical of the Cathedral of his diocese, spiritual director and professor of the seminar. He spent some years in Rome as scholar of the Spanish National Church of Santiago uh, and Montserrat, where he wrote many essays on the pastoral and on priest spirituality. Before being appointed as bishop, he was vicar general in the diocese of Albacete. Then, after his stay in Galicia, in 1975, he was sent to Valladolid as a Metropolitan Archbishop, where he stayed until his retirement in 2002. He passed away in 2014. In Galicia, his first challenge was to obtain the acceptation, the consolidation of the double Episcopal role, which in 1959 was divided between the historical town of Tui and the bigger city of Vigo, which was constantly growing. But the young bishop, besides being an idealist, was also a great animator, a person that was used to work in a team who tried to instill a new pace to the pastoral action of the priests to make it new and attractive. In his opinion, the evangelization should take uh, a primary uh, place in the activity of the church, far beyond the preservation, far over the preservation of tradition. So, with the goal of applying the spirit of uh, the Second Vatican Council to the local reality, he organized the Pastoral Council of Galicia. And even though his transfer to Valladolid in 1975 prevented him to assist to the end of the works, the third of the documents of the Pastoral Council would have dealt significantly with the renewed liturgy uh, in the Pastoral of the Church.
the new ecclesiastic attitude vis-a-vis -vis the society and the uh, priority of uh, the pastoral activity motivated the Licato Baeta in decreeing in 1970 the construction of new parishes in the uh, municipality of Vigo. In his motivations, he based his decision to amend the parish network on the excessive territorial extension of the existing parishes and on the high number of uh, parish goers. On the 31st October of 1970, the bishop signed three decrees. The amendment of the Archpriest organization of the diocese of Tui Vigo, the amendment of the borders of the parishes of the city, and the creation of 14 new parishes in Vigo, the first aimed at increasing the effectiveness of the apostolic work, uh, dividing the diocese in 22 arch uh, priests, seven of which uh, corresponded to the territorial area of the municipality of Vigo. On his part, the amendment decree of parish uh, borders affected 19 parishes of Vigo. Among the historical one, the two of the city centre, Santa Maria and uh, James the uh, Elder, and seven of the periphery, and also those created during the century 1902, 1947, and 1958. The third decree created the parish of San John of Avila, San Francis Saverio, San Tocurato d'Arsa, San Paio, Saint Teresa of Jesus, uh, Mary, Mother of the Good Pastor, Saint Lucy, the uh, heart of uh, Maria, Mary, Mary uh, the helper, our Lady of Rocio, Our Lady of uh, Mount Carmel, and St. Paul. The energetic action of uh, the priest was not just of local interest, but also drew the attention of the national press. For example, the ABC newspaper titled The New Pastoral calls for the restructuration, a, a renovation of the parishes. We need to build temples that are one with the buildings. The article had many considerations of the bishop on the new urban pastoral and its repercussions on the religious life. Urban life appears in the line of Paul VI as a challenge to Christianity because, and I quote, it's... It individuates a special kind of citizen that can be emarginated from the pastoral action of the church, end of uh, quotation, since general urbanization or almost generalized as, and I quote once again, one of the most influencing factors on the life of people under all aspects. In the same day, in an interview with the Spanish newspaper La Vanguardia, the bishop explained, and I quote, urban parishes must have human sizes. When we overcome the conventional limits, the religious liveliness is inversely proportional to the size of the population. We need, in the cities, we need the pastoral implying knowledge, proximity, and dialogue. Multiplying the number of people in a parish which is bigger than normal, it's not an effective solution. You end up by knowing the same circle of uh, uh, churchgoers. The outcome can be multiplied by dividing the center of the different communities. The uh, ideal uh, capacity of a parish uh, church is 600 seats and must be located in the ordinary meeting uh, places, end of quote. Delicato Baeza summarized the problem of the new parishes and churches in two concepts, their ideal dimension and their location in the city. For the pastoral action to be effective, he set the ideal dimension of a parish in a range between four and 6,000 inhabitants and the capacity of a church in 600 seats. 
as for the relationship with the city, he said that the church should envisage its own situation according to the urban development, and that the church should think about the possibility of building places of worship in the basement of buildings in order to make funding possible. I think that was effectively applied to solve the uh, to find uh, the place of newly uh, established parishes, as we will see uh, later on. Unfortunately, we missed the image on top. Seven parishes were given to religious congregations that put their own churches and priests at disposal. The Divina Pastora. Maria Auxiliatrice, Mary the Helper, San Francis Javier for the Jesuit Fathers, the Immaculate Heart of Mary uh, to the uh, St. Clair missionaries, the Mother of Perpetual Help uh, to the Redentorists, and how our lady of Mount Carmelo to the Carmelitans. Some of those congregations recently took the renovation of their own churches. Besides, the former chapel of the College of the Company of Mary was the headquarters of the new parish of St. John of uh, Avila and St. Joan of Lestonac, even though it would have been served by diocesan priests. The bishop also opened to public worship the church that Bishop Eiko Igarai built several years before as a private chapel on the hill of Castro, on the Castro Hill, destinating it as a new parish of uh, Our Lady of Solitude. We should underline that even though the relationship between urban development and parish was indicated by the Delicato Baeta as a necessary condition for a real connection between the structure of the church and the needs of the citizens, the handing over of parishes to a religious congregation meant to make the most of their own positioning. So in these cases, the parish structure had to adapt to the position of the existing churches and not the other way around. Besides, however, this solution represented was a great response to the densification of the urban centers, since at that time this building were at the center of the consolidated city, even though at first their position was more peripheral, as you can see from the map. It's the case of the school of the Jesuit friars in Pace, which with the growth of uh, the San Jurco Badia Road, which is this road, became connected to the urban uh, fabric. The Divina Pastora and the Immaculate Heart of Mary close to the uh, Spain Square, Mary the Helper and San Juan of Lestonac, around the expansion area of the Camellian Venezuela Road and the one of the Carmelitan Fathers in uh, Lopez Mora Road, close to the newly and flourish, new and flourishing uh, neighborhood of Las Traviesas. Of the 14 uh, newly created parishes, six of them needed new buildings. Santo Grato d'Ar, San Paio, St. Teresa of Jesus, uh, San Lucy, Our Lady of Rothio, and St. Paul, to which Oncoming, income, uh, ongoing uh, works were uh, going on because the temples weren't finished yet. The development of uh, planning facilitated the location of these new buildings, like in the case of Our Lady of Rocío, in the uh, industrial area of Coya, St. Luthien, Salgueira, or the, the Holy uh, Curato d'Ar, so something that was possible thanks to the Bailen uh, Action Unit Plan. The parish center of Sampaio was built with the authorization of the ministry to build on 
built classified uh, by general plan as agricultural land. An authorization made in derogation of Article 69 of the uh, 1963 property law. The parishes of St. Teresa of Jesus and St. Paul were placed in commercial basements. Put in practice what Delicato Baeta said, who said that we should have to, con we should consider this possibility. In the case of Santa Saint Teresa, a delay was feared in the uh, development of the partial plan of Lavadores. Therefore, a more direct solution was uh, chosen by purchasing a plot of land with an, incomplete, with an incomplete construction. On the other hand, at the beginning of the same decade, architecture underwent the effects of the confusion pro provoked by the crisis of modern architecture and the period of immediate reaction in the moment in which the access to the Spanish society, uh, uh, the access of the Spanish society to knowledge of what was produced outside of our borders was almost complete. The same happened with religious architecture, which set free from its historical boundaries and uh, filled with an uh, open mentality in the after the Second Vatican Council had in an optimal moment of development. But in Spain, some signs of uh, uh, the loss of importance as an innovative typology were already perceived, while in Galicia, a broader group of architects started to uh, take charge of projects, especially those related to development companies or construction companies. Even though the pace of building of the ecclesiastic, even though the, the building pace of ecclesiastic construction in Galicia and uh, uh, the whole of Spain was dropping at the beginning of the 70s, the dioceses needed to build several churches in, uh, uh, in Vigo because six out of the 14 uh, because six of the 14 recently created parishes wouldn't have been situated in the already built temples. So if in the previous decades, decades the absolute protagonist was uh, architect Antonio Cominges, a historicist, in the 70s, Desiderio Bernas became the top architect of the uh, bishop. Pernas had three simultaneous um, jobs, San Paio uh, de Lavadores in 1972, Santo Grato and Our Lady of Rocío. So we can make assumptions on this accumulation of duties, but what is clear is besides that beyond the fact that he was the most famous architect in the city in, ta uh, in that moment, he could uh, combine economy, uh, cost effectiveness, elegance, and speed in the construction of the building, which perfectly adapted to the urgency and the lack of fund by the dioceses. As a matter of fact, there's no doubt that the economic precariousness of a church with few resources and a lot of need, with a few resources and a lot of needs, might affect the projects of the architects that worked for the church in that period. And if we limit ourselves to the case of Pernas, without going beyond, the parish center of Nigran was not built. And the parish center of Our Lady of Rocio was partly built. Reckless successive of uh, intervention mutilated the church of some Paolo and urban planning difficulties uh, led to the abandoning of the construction of Santo Curato das, which would have been taken back later with the project by Pernas and other architects. Only the Church of Santa Chiara and its essentiality was untouched. Generally speaking, the construction of new parishes, parish buildings, was very slow since it was affected by the growing problem of funds, many parishes started their activities in provisional places. And even though the juridical consideration of churches as structures made uh, the purchase of land easier, 
This problem ended up uh, led to a change in the architectural model. The foundation of new parishes in the Diocese of Tui Vigo was a difficult process, strictly interconnected to the urban development of the city, with which, slowly, the parish that defined the physical territories was replaced by the ecclesiastic parish, which was still able to create increasingly independent commun communities were increasingly independent from territoriality. Atten in any case, the new parish building that accompanied the, um, the new parish organization process promoted by Bishop José Delicado Baeza were still the center of a territorial structure which is deeply rooted in the Galician subcon subconsciousness. Therefore, the multiple perspective provided by the study of parish architecture, while observing the parallel evolution in the three architectural, in the three uh, architectural, urban, and ecclesiastic aspects, provides an overview and uh, a an comprehensive and plural overview of Vigo in the last decades of the 20th century establishing at the same time a very useful reference framework to understand the architecture of the city, paving the road to uh, research the careers of the bishops and the architects that uh, were uh, found themselves uh, uh, in the uh, religious programs in this precise historical moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Camion. Let's move on to Italy with Rosa Maria, Carta, uh, Rosa Maria um, Caruso, uh, 2018 graduate at uh, Special Structure of Architecture in Syracuse. It won a grant in 2019. She coordinated a series of meetings organized by ISAR, the the Italian Association for the History of Architecture, where she presented her PhD thesis uh, titled uh, 1969 uh, uh, Public uh, Competition for Building the, um, um, the Building uh, in Messina. It's tw you have 20 minutes. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity in order to present something that is not really central uh, with respect to where the debate is in Italy when it comes to uh, sacred architectural buildings. And we also uh, saw that yesterday with Milan but it's still a very interesting uh, example because these are, you know, Syracuse is still a, a place uh, that's been characterized by in these years by some uh, renovations or reconstructions, among which there's the urban expansion that required the need to build new services for, for the people, and among which there were churches, of course. I, I uh, selected three case studies. The main one is in Syracuse in Sicily, despite being in that area that is rather peripheric. Actually, in those years, it was really at the center of interest, of everyone's interest when it comes to sacred architecture, because there was the public, uh, uh, the call for tenders for the Basilica Sanctuary of Our Lady of Tears, and to, then to other small centers. But I would yet present some case studies of, of a local architect to show how much the uh, sacred architecture have, has declined, has um, you know, it's presented itself in these smaller centers. These are three case studies. The first, the first one, is the Basilica Sanctuary of Our Lady of Tears, is probably the most famous. The other two are the Enzo Fortuna's uh, buildings, 
the fil rouge is really the it's this local architect who uh, some of his projects have been uh, donated to uh, the University of Syracuse and you know worked on the Basilica Sanctuary of Our Lady of Tears together with many important architects and designers. And then he had the chance to work in this territory to uh, build sacred spaces. Of course, these are different times. And the, the other two examples are quite different from each other, but in the San Giuseppe Church in Cassibile, before the, the count, the council reform and the, the one by Lentini is after the second council, Vatican council. Let's start from the more interesting case of all of the three, which is the uh, co for the Basilica Sanctuary of Our Lady of Tears. In 1955, uh, mappings, there's this uh, uh, co but why? That's because there was something really that struck a lot of people back in the days. That this was this uh, statue of the Virgin Mary that uh, had blood, uh, blood, um, tears of blood. So there were many people doing uh, pilgrimages in that area because of that event. This uh, space was not really close to the historical center of Artigia, but at the purpose of be a sort of new uh, urban pole in the urban area in uh, to respond a bit to the northern expansion of Syracuse back in those days with the 1955 uh, uh, Bianca project. This area is as a very important strategic uh, 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 role because there are uh, two uh, theaters. There's an amphi uh, amphitheater also. Then uh, there's also an um, archaeological museum, Paolo Orsi, in that area. So it had a strategic role there, and it was a, a point of interest for in, in order to have a northern expansion of the city. And you know, so the call for tenders actually uh, gave pretty much a lot of freedom to designers because, of course, it gave some guidelines on the number of, of churchgoers that uh, at the the building had to host. Uh, of course, it also indicated that. They had to design the spaces serving the actual uh, sanctuary. So it had, it had to be a multifunctional space. So all the spaces that we talked about yesterday as well, that, you know, had a liturgic role. In the Article 7, there was this guideline about how to manage the space. Uh, buildings had to organize in how uh, architecture is preferred, but with one condition. So the front of the church ha has to be in front of uh, uh, the Piazza Vittoria. So the pictures are not great, but they're taken from a magazine at the time that show the state of Piazza, La Vitt Piazza La Vittoria uh, during the period that the Tendus was published. In 1955, this uh, Enzo Fortuna, uh, this architect, uh, wrote that this area was compromised by uh, uh, by uh, mm, house projects, basically. So it gave a lot of freedom to uh, work on this area. And that's why probably uh, designers, without having any formal guidelines, they did a lot of experimenting uh, at the time because considering things that were um, very uh, important at the time. 
for example, on the podium, uh, we uh, there are th there was th these three uh, uh, winners, uh, Michel Parra, uh, um, uh, um, Michel Androu, sorry, and Pierre Parra won. Actually, the preference for the central uh, plan was clear. The third one uh, was won by uh, Erwin Schiffer, a German uh, architect, a German designer. That a, a project that was slightly um, more similar to the pre-existing architectural buildings in Syracuse at the time. So the, that's the sanctuary. Uh, sorry, that the church of Santa Lucia al Sepulcro. They were close to the sanctuary. These are other examples that I uh, put here because there was a great uh, possibility for uh, debating at the time. There were all sorts of uh, quite famous architectures, at least domestically. These are uh, a bunch of architects that were presented. There was also Rudolf Schwarz that has been uh, mentioned uh, a lot in these two days, two, these last two days. He took part in it, but without ha having any uh, specific requirements to participate. And so Fortuna also participated to it. So it's interesting to see how a local architect, compared to what we uh, spoke before, how he uh, gave his uh, proposal. Uh, and so Fortuna, I, like, I have to say, that was invited to participate by Mario Tedeschi because they, the two knew each other during uh, their uh, formation period in Rome uh, between the 30s and the 40s. Of course, their experiences in when it comes to sacred architecture were rather different. And so Fortuna had a chance to work on a small sanctuary in, in Syracuse in 1946, whereas Mario Tedeschi... And I saw also yesterday the case of the Cotiotto neighborhood had slightly more uh, known arc, um, experiences in on, on a national level. It's rather likely, but we're not certain, that Mario Tedeschi worked more on proposing a shape of the sanctuary following uh, Enzo Fortuna's uh, guidelines. Uh, we actually knew the place, so he mainly worked on how to build in terms of shape uh, the sanctuary and then when it comes to the services as well of course we have here their project uh, uh, it was uh, was mentioned it was uh, praised when it comes to where to collocate the front of the building uh, that to be in front of Piazza la Vittoria but it's red uh, we have uh, it's kind of a classic plan we have a uh, Latin cross that is quite different though from the winning projects of that call for tennis. It, it's apparently quite simple architecture. It's, you know, the fact of uh, mm, underlining the Presbyterian area is something that was looked for uh, back in the day. There's also a picture of the uh, of of the what was supposed to be the the church, and there's this Latin cross that is uh, elevated in terms of its volume, and so there's the facade uh, without any sort of decorations that were typical of sacred architecture in the past, and it almost repeats itself in a always larger way, having a sort of, um, having a particular effect of a uh, sort of domino effect. And so there was this change in the volume compared to the nave. So, but still the details are very painstakingly done because there's they wanted to give a sense of movement. They do that by having pillars that could be seen playing with lights and shadows and there's this um it's a vertical uh sense that was given in the facade to then to enter the the church there's a rationalist 
um, aspects in the church too. And we see in, that in the hall and then in the nearby buildings. Also the fact that, that these uh, porches were uh, quite small compared to the mass of the church uh, have this generated this particular connection between all the all of these spaces today. This is how it looks. The sanctuary uh, it was only finished in 1994, so it was even they, we, they even called it Cardamorandi in the 60s. So it was something that was really um, talked about at the time. They, of course, meet the goal of they met the goal of uh, leaving a symbol of uh, what had happened uh, uh, with the the bloody tears of the Virgin Mary, and it's quite uh, typical now of Syracuse's skyline. These are pictures that I've taken myself to show uh, slightly closer and slightly further far what's the impact of the sanctuary on the nearby area. The two case studies from uh, Cassibile Lentini that I picked here, I you know, picked the two uh, areas where the churches were located. When it comes to Cassibile, there wasn't really a church at the time. when they were asked to build the uh, church to at Enzo Fortuna in 1955. That's because the damages from the war were quite heavy. So the locals uh, went to uh, the church in Syracuse that was 15 kilometers from Cassibile. When it comes to Lentini, that's a different situation because it's an area that comes from the expansion of the city. So we have this church in a neighborhood that uh, was a neighborhood for the expansion of the city. These two case studies, yeah, I wanna I wanna show them through the drawings done by uh, Enzo Fortuna on how to think about uh, sacred spaces. These are actually the first years of study for the San Giuseppe Church in 1956, and I've noticed that he always uh, thinks about the. Uh, change of volumes that he maybe took from uh, participating in the cold attendance for the sanctuary, but also adding some slight changes on the sides of the of the church. It is quite likely that Enzo Fortuna knew the cold attendance for uh, the Santa Maria, uh, Chiesa Santa Maria Vittoria in Franca Villa Mare. Where this this change between the central nave that was definitely quite uh, higher than the rest of the church, but Enzo Fortuna tries to uh, do that in a smaller uh, framework. Of course, there was uh, probably Enzo Fortuna was interested in this confraternity because in the second uh, um, uh, hypothetical project, second uh, possible design. We see that how he took the the roof that was presented in that call for tenants in nineteen forty eight. So he proposes a, a slightly complex uh, roof that still yet yeah, becomes became quite characteristic of of his church. It also draws from the the diagram of the uh, internal part of the of the church but it was then abandoned later as an idea also one of the reasons was the costs of building that so it... the second case study is that of the uh, church of cristalentini uh, Realentini, and we see that space is perceived in a different way. Ex he explicitly expressed his interest from the des him, the designer, in the 1974 project to um, uh, to include all the guidelines from the Second Vatican Council, and he does that 
thinking about a, a unique central space where the altar is underlined by um by some uh you know way to uh highlight it with the with the light now the Cristo Re, uh, that's right now the Cristo Re church the f although this church is tend to get lost in the urban area and the fabric of the urban area the fact that there's a church also near the a church uh, you know underlines that but in this case it, it kind of feels like it's losing in the fabric of the of the area and that's a bit more uh you know an answer to the second uh council vatican vatican council beg your pardon so now i'm going to the end uh, you know, we had three case studies that we analyzed uh, you know, uh, that were taken through uh, Enzo Fortuna's experience. And he uh, became an important professional figure uh, together with Zucconi's research, of course, where he writes that often, oftentimes these people should be hired as uh, in, in the projects to work on small uh, architectural buildings. And it's important to uh, to give importance to some aspects that were only analyzed through some case studies, giving us a, a, an image of uh, a reality that is really interested in these uh, aspects. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Also for sticking to the time, and then we uh, go on with Italy. And I would like to invite on stage Professor Ricardo Serraglio, Associate Professor of History of Architecture at the uh, University of Campania Luigi Vanvitelli of Caserta, where he holds uh, courses of history of exam of examination of the architecture and history of the context. So most of <clears throat> The research of Professor Serraglio is based on religious building in both contemporary and modern age through um, research project, collaboration with Italian institutes and periods abroad. Among the important publications is the ones that are related to religious uh, architecture, both in the Campania region and not, studies that are related to the activities of Francesco Policini, but also the Roman one, I remember texts on Davide Paraloschi and Capisardi, and the great uh, report uh, of 2015 on the churches of Caserta. Now, in uh, continuation with this research topics, Professor Serraglio will deliver a speech called The Non Actual Modernity of the uh, Neighborhood Churches of Marcello Canino. You have 20 minutes, the floor to you. First of all, thank you very much to the organization we know how much is hard to organize uh, these meetings so really heartful thanks to the organization also for inviting me and to, for accepting my submission so if i had to overshoot 20 uh, minutes please make a gesture and i will stop so the introduction is this which then connects to the previous speeches of the spreading of a peripheral uh, architectural uh, culture, but up to a point also few uh, re less historicized uh, um, important characters are not very well remembered because they weren't children of architecture and there was no culture also for an introverted character of the designer right now that we are going to know. The framework is post-war rebuilding, and I would like to make a presentation here. I'd like to make a remark here. Abroad, we heard talking about Portugal, Spain, Germany, but abroad there was the need to find space for 
parish center in expanding city cities in Italy. The situation is similar, but it's not the same because Italy, besides the way of using the fundings for new uh, for new neighborhoods, so the Fanfani law and anything related to it, there was a specific law, the Adesio law, but promoted by Giovanni Costantini, the president of the Central Commission for Sacred Art in Italy, which by law, the churches are at the center of the neighborhoods. The Christian Democrats, after the Second World War, were the uh, parties ruling in Italy, and they fear the possibility that peripheral neighborhoods, the peripheral near to the factories and the working class would then steer towards uh, communism. Therefore, Christian Democrats decided to put Paris Center at the center of the new uh, district. So there is a law envisaging this. The expanding neighborhoods of uh, big or small Italian towns are built around the center of new Paris centers, which were funded by the Aldisio law. The role of bishops became fundamental. Here in Bologna, we cannot avoid mentioning Cardinal Lercaro, like Cardinal Montini in Milan, that were the two most famous, the two bishops that were the most, the closest to uh, modern architecture and art. But every diocese had a bishop that became the passion of many architectural works and many churches. And with a certain degree of freedom, because as it was said by many scholars, there's not a guideline prevailing over others. So in some centers, modernity prevails because bishops are more open to modernity. While in other centers, historicism prevailed because bishops had a different cultural heritage. So in this case, we are going to talk about Southern Italy. We will talk about Marcello Canino. Marcello Canino isn't a very famous architect, but he had a fundamental role in the architect in the Ita Italian architecture in the post-war period. He was the founder and the dean of the faculty of the School of Architecture in Naples at the Federico II University, and has been and he was and he had been dean for many years, from 1943 to 1952. And he was the master of entire generation of architects. However, he was born during the fascist regime. He graduated in engineering because the family didn't have the money to pay his studies in Rome, where there was the school, the first school of architecture. And he wanted to go there, but he had to stop in Naples. So he graduated in civil engineering, but he still, but he cooperated with Piacentini. So the line is the um, architecture of the fascist regime, but he wasn't implied in a political events that would lead to the apparition of many uh, Neapolitan architects after the uh, Second World War, because even though he was close to the national fascist party he never committed anything wrong let's say so he was still the dean and the designer of naples after the second world war the scope of his works is very broad i'm not going to remind it here but i remember but i remind you that in 1953 one year after his mandate as the dean of the school He looked for new professional jobs, and among them was the building of many neighborhood churches. So in post-war, he was the correspondent for Naples, for Southern Italy, with the Central Commission, with Costantini, for the restoration that of the churches that were bombed during the war. So they had to be rebuilt. And in this phase, he, become a, he became a designer of new churches, and he participated with success to uh, calls for tender the one in Messina during the fascist period, which he won, but then the project was not carried out. And the famous one of the Church of the Salesian of San, John, San Giovanni Bosco in Roma, in Rome, where he ranked third uh, over 110 
bidders, but then he will build the churches in the second post-war. So, and there is a set of projects that are dated between 1953 and 1959. And I say it once for all, because I don't want to be redundant. The process was always the same. The bishop commissioned the process, the architect made, submits a proposal, and it's almost never accepted, except in the case of Canino, uh, but it's accepted with reserve. So some amendments and variations are asked, and it's approved uh, in at the second stage. Uh, and then the problem of funding starts, which go, uh, which have to go towards the Ministry of Public Works and the Central Commission. So the funding is for the construction of the same of the sole structures and to buy the uh, the land. So when they build the property and then they um build the row building then they have to complete with funds of the parishes some priests uh, paid with their own money to pay uh, for their churches uh, like the case that we are in some cases that we are going to see right now and quite often there were also problems structural problems because when you design a church it's not like now that you call a geologist the structurist and engineers Sometimes these churches in peripheral areas province with the foundation because there's a clay uh, ground. So they have a process that you know, takes around 10 years from the approval, from the start of the jobs to the uh, grand opening of these churches. The Tisli is the non-current modernity. So the best... Uh, the best pupil of Marcello Canino, Michele Capobianco, who... Uh, became the dean of uh, uh, project architecture in Naples for decades to define this master like this because Canino is a character that must be placed in a thread that was called the other modernity. So in this cases, we look for a, a modern language also for ecclesiastic architecture, but it, that's not exclusively the language of modern movement, the language of Esprit Novo or Esprit de Geometry. It's language that, in the case of Canino, cannot be decided as a historicist. So he is based, he based himself in the history of architecture because as a self-taught architect, he is inspired. He couldn't go to the, he couldn't attend the School of Architecture, but he imagined the repertoire of medieval and Renaissance architecture, like an alphabet, like a sort of syllabus to be rethought, uh, to be reinterpreted in a modern way. So these buildings that have many direct references and Capoeira called them non-current because they, because they left us puzzled. Because it's not a, an architecture of quotation, but it's an architecture of modern reinterpretation of an ancient language, which belongs to the Italian tradition. For example, we're going to see that there is a used, a big used of cement also in the forms of, of concrete in the form of uh, traditional architecture. So this is in the diocese of modern, let me read the notes in order not to lose track. The Virgin of Rosary in Saramazzoni in province of Modena, the bishop was the Bishop Boccolieri. This is an example of what we said so far. So trying to find an ecclesiastic hall where the assembly of the worshippers is not the distance between the uh, priest celebrating the rite and the people attending to it, but a direct participation of the assembly of the worshiper to shippers to the right. So we find some forms that even though they are related to the tradition might have the worshippers in the proximity of the altar. And in this case, it's this weird octagon which has shorter oblique, oblique sides and With an element, the roof, the roof is uh, taken from medieval churches, but it's not uh, part of the structure. There are 
some concrete or wooden roofs with where some uh, fake ceilings uh, fake these uh, uh, rounded uh, roofs. So this is the sketch of the church and this is the construction. So you also have amendments of the projects in the works. And here is a problem that, that puts in common the churches and the uh, neighborhoods. So the uh, Vele building in Scampia in Naples, for example, are known by everybody as a place of crime and danger, but the process, uh, the initial project was great, but only residential buildings were, were carried out and were reduced, they were um, very simplified and the accessory, the structures were done, the library, schools, gyms, and uh, sports field were done because there were no funds. So this is what happens with the churches. What is done is only the ecclesiastic building. But we should notice that the character of Marcello Canino's architecture is a very non-current uh, one because these churches are disconnected from the surrounding environment, both visually and uh, architecturally in many cases. We've seen churches reminding in concrete uh, 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 structures and the bricks, they recall the uh, houses around it, but can you know, always found a distance from the surrounding environment? So a question that I ask myself, if he tried to have a, if it even tried to have a relationship with the city and territory, because sometimes he repeated the same project in different occasions. So he made occasions and then he reprocessed them, he amended them to uh, and adapted them to the situations that were proposed. So he never thought that the project for that specific purpose is what Le Corbusier would have done here in Bologna. He took a project and he proposed in Bologna and Calin Canino did the same. The inside of the church, you can see these membranes, they are in open concrete. So the aesthetic of concrete comes back in architecture, So, which I cannot uh, see. But I think that this is a language that lies between Renaissance and Middle Ages, which is reprocessed originally by Canino. He did something different in a small town near Benevento. Limatola, where there's a current picture taken from uh, Google Maps. And uh, during the building of the church, there was a raised castle and a floodplain because there was a river, the Voltunno River, which ran uh, next to this uh, environment. There were just a few houses. So the city was moved from the castle, from the mountain to the plain. Roads were built and as the first building of this new residential compound was the church. So first the church and then the neighborhood. And in this case, Marcello Canino drew inspiration from the reprocessing of a language and the culture that comes from the past, but which I won't say that is based on the past because it's been reprocessed in original ways. So we are going to see, for example, the presence of these tall pillars, which suits like Le Corbusier in Piloti, I mean, and other churches. So they must be connected by horizontal uh, elements, beams, because they are too tall. And these are very earthquakes, uh, very much earthquake uh, area. So tall and thin structures cannot be uh, designed by law in that area. So the fake ceiling by Canino with the elements of uh, uh, the round roof and this belfry, uh, this bell tower that recalls and idealizes a Romanic church. But there are no examples of known Romanic uh, building, probably the dome of old Caserta, which is 10 kilometers away, but this, but he didn't make reference to that. He reprocessed in an original way, his own way of expressing himself that we are going to see. And this is the church as it looks now. 
it's separated by a gate, by a fence, compared to the city. So there's no big appeal compared to the population of the small municipality that has more or less 10,000 inhabitants. The church of Limatola, it's the church of the of the 16th century, which is uh, put, which is far away from this, but this is a bit non-current, a bit, I mean, it's a bit, you know, non-related to the surrounding village. The uh, internals with uh, twin windows, you can see how uh, the pillars are tall and thin. So this research of modernity. So Canino was a very cultured person. He traveled as the dean uh, of the School of Architecture. He went to Germany, to France. He met the modern architect. architect. So if he made this choice, it's not because it was um, localist, but he imagined to reprocess um, modern architecture in original terms by preserving the traditions of the past. So the edicule and uh, uh, with uh, holy images and then the altars. They are a quotation of late Renaissance. So I remember some articles by Odosio, Rodosio, but not in a specific way. So we move to Frasso Telesino. We are still near Benevento, so we are nearby. The Church of Santa Giuliana. And here it was a different uh, work because clearly, well, I'm sorry, he also affected the planimetry, so there is more chapel, and he inverted the chapel. But I will go on because I want to show you the most interesting ones. So very quickly, I know I run out of time, but San Pietro in Cattedra in Caserta, an elliptical church, an elliptical church which is... Uh, and it's one that where we found many projects for many neighbors in Caserta. He tried uh, many times and he put it in this neighborhood, in the Vampitelli neighborhood, which is the same name of his university, but it was designed for other places, but then it was adapted to this place. Inside the church, in the church there are some experiments that put him closer to the Baroque. Everything changes in the inside. Take a look at these very tall pillars with this uh, sail, so with, with this sort of curve. So you see, it's an original language that puzzles us. And then the final one, the most important one, in the Traiano district uh, in Naples, which was supposed to have just the this district, 30,000 uh, uh, people. So all the inhabitants of Via Marina and Naples who lost their house were supposed to be moved in this new town that was created in the outskirts of Naples. So Marcello Canino made the sketch of the whole neighborhood. And in this case, so he designed the square in front of the church and he imagined a church, a traditional church, with its fake ceilings, with this barrel vaults, with these pillars, and the quotation of the bell tower. This is the first, uh, uh, and it's a quotation, and, and, and it's a reference to the bell tower of the of San Marco in Venice. This is a render of how it was supposed to be, and then the church was built. And in this case, you can see the element that they had to put to remove any seismic uh, problems, so the steel beams. And you can see that there is a relationship with the, uh, with the neighborhood. And, uh, but this was a request by the patronage, not, it was not uh, his work. Uh, so then the uh, three part uh, facade, the Cathedral of uh, uh, Ferrara, a way of drawing uh, with this geometry, the facade of his uh, church is like Saminiato al Monte in Florence. The bell tower, which looks like uh, San Marco Square in, uh, in Venice, the elliptical plant, which recalls Bernini, or Piacentini in the chapel of uh, uh, Sapienza, and the arch, uh, the raised arch, like the, the Dome of Pisa, 
So he reprocessed the set of elements that he drew from his deep knowledge of uh, history of Italian architecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. And let's uh, enlarge this wonderful uh, overview of Italy going north. And I call here Giorgio Nepotevesin and Martina Ulbar, who will uh, take us to Ivrea in Piedmont. Giorgio is graduated at the Polytechnic of Torino and is doing his PhD in Roma 3, together with uh, the uh, Archivio Storico, uh, the historical archive in Ivrea. He already published different researches. Uh, presenting and has presented the peculiar uh, Olivetti's company town in Ivrea. And as I said before, same thing for uh, architect Car Caruso. He also works in the orchestra um, uh, conferences. Patina Ulbar, she graduated in Ferrara and she's doing a PhD in um, Turin, where she has a research with a promising uh, title on post-war architecture together with uh, another uh, researcher. And they present us today, Olivetti and uh, uh, Catholic uh, uh, patronage. Uh, thank you, you, have also, you also have two minutes. Can you hear me? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for allowing us to presenting our work in this conference. We work on churches in the city of Ivrea. Then to go and um, brought, to talk about a broader uh, 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 topic, and it's that's Olivetti's commitment in uh, religious architecture. I we picked Olivetti's Olivetti because it's a really a typical example and it is also the and a typical uh, when it comes to uh, companies back in the 50s like uh, any or fiat uh, especially because of its great sensitivity when it comes to charity uh, and then that was brought on also onto design and architecture a key figure has been uh, Adriano Livietti was was president between 1938 and 1960, when then he died. And this is all about uh, Olivetti's figure. We want to analyze his presidency and the, the period after it. And it's talking about the political also relationship with uh, church and then its consequences on, um, on the urban areas and in particular in Ivrea and in, in the uh, architectural buildings in Ivrea. Let's start from Adrian Olivetti's role in developing a new model of the uh, of that area, uh, uh, mixed between socialism, state socialism and liberalism. It's a project that involves Olivetti and its uh, different uh, sub-companies and it wants to integrate to uh, ur to urban development a certain number of uh, you know, political aspects. Adriano, yeah, sorry. This model of community as its roots in the complex uh, spirituality that Olive uh, the Adriano had that is between three religions, Judaism, Catholicism, and Baltism. And the Christian component is definitely a consequence more on the architecture and specifically in the Cartomesto district that we actually analyzed as a, as a case study. The first point that I wanted to could clarify was its a complex relationship between Adriano Levetti and the and the church. 
despite religion being central in this project, in the community community project, and that is shared by the gospel, is understood as a, a superior law of the community. And as we're going to see, a church is always contemplated in urban planning. That has been done since the 30s. At the same time, Adriano rejects quite overtly the ideas that was coming from uh, Christian Democrats and the church because they were she he considered them too regressive compared to uh, what he wanted to see. So it's a Christian former uh, ref, uh, reform, uh, reform that is also inclusive towards non-believers. This sense of uh, reform is also um, was also shown in the uh, Ivrea area. So this this ambiguity and divisions were quite clear, but that doesn't lead to an actual conflict, but more towards indifference, especially because the clergy is quite confused by the by Olivetti's approach whereas they did so with uh, socialist and communist ideas. This strong tension, strong political tension has consequences on urban planning as well, especially in the relationship between the church and the neighborhood. And as we've seen before, something that is at the center of debate, uh, both in um, specialized magazines and in the nation in general, this is this instrument becomes a way on how to understand this uh, relationship, uh, starting from the relationships uh, that were done in on sacred architecture on Bologna and Milano in the fifties. Uh, the the importance of the parish was understood in according to uh, Cardinal Del Caro, the church. Uh, the church's aim is to give its aim to the neighborhood. And so the church was the core and the heart of the neighborhood. This model can be seen uh, many times uh, uh, since the Fanfanini law. And an, uh, an important example is the La Martella neighborhood in Matera. And uh, its design was commissioned by uh, Olivetti, Adriano Olivetti, to Ludovico Quaroni, who at the time was working also on new urban plannings in Ivrea, but something different happened. And in this equation between uh, the church and the parish, he wants to give uh, all the social, social um, work back to the parish. And Malcaro opposed that because he called these uh, community centers, he accused them of having a role in in, in, in working on uh, the community, but not on the soul of the neighborhood. But what Adriano thought uh, had its roots in in what Simon Weil, uh, Manford thought, and they were also a reference point for the uh, Christian community, and they, uh, you know, the first uh, translators translations in Italian had a pivotal role uh, in this uh, topic between forty eight and fifty six. Uh, Adriano Livetti uh, commissioned uh, a lot of projects in Ivrea. And you know, churches were near roads, but were out were quite far, far from uh, um, from houses. The structure was proposed for uh, residential neighborhoods had in uh, community services as the core of the neighborhood.
It was the same thing uh, in the 50s then. And these plans had uh, Adriano being involved in it, but also uh, Giovanni Astengo, Carlo Doglio, Luigi uh, Piccinato, and Luigi Figini, together with uh, Pollini. It's important to underline that some of the architects uh, were involved in the first um, uh, conference on secular architecture in Bologna, and who then happened to write in the Chiesa Quartiere magazine, where proper uh, arch uh, Olivetti's architects. And they, but Luigi Fugini had an important role, and we can thank him for uh, Olivetti's, um, Olivetti's role in the magazine. The rejection of these uh, plans pr uh, proposed by uh, Olivetti is due to a strong political opposition they met both from the Democratic Christian Democrats and the, the trade unions. Also because uh, Adriano became mayor for uh, uh, the Movimento di Comunità. This conflict was exemplified by a neighborhood that had a bishop, the, sorry, the neighbor of Canton Vesco. So this context had a huge difference between uh, Olivetti's point of view and the church's point of view. And in this context, uh, a request came from a priest in 1955 to Adriano Olivetti to build a... Uh, um, uh, to build a space where to teach religion. The priest also wanted that uh, actually citizen would build this uh, building in order to have more involvement of the community. But when Adriano received his, this request, he, he just uh, took, uh, you know, he just he actually just picked the the designers himself, and he even financed uh, the, this church, donating almost the, the double amount of what citizens donated. And we saw from documents that a part of this uh, funds came from a 1952 uh, uh, fund, the 1950s funds for uh, building uh, churches. So it was kind of free from the influence of the church and he made all the decisions. So that autonomy that was clear when it comes to a political point, a political framework, it, it was the same case when designing the Sacroquatius church. So he, he picked his own designers. He picked two uh, architects that were part of Olivetti's world who had already built some uh, houses in Canton Vesco that were clearly uh, rationalist uh, houses. But from, he actually also picked Aldo Favini, wasn't part of his uh, company, who was working on uh, decompressing uh, concrete. Sacroquatis Church became almost an excuse of uh, adding another um, uh, another building to uh, those uh, he financed. He also hired new professionals that were slightly more uh, contemporary in their uh, attitude. So he both had uh, Olivetti both had his own architects and also external architects. So as we can see from the plan, the main hall is characterized by uh, by uh, 
part that is more or less what uh, the architect wanted to um, do. The rest was done uh, thanks to these uh, pre-compression uh, method by Favini. They were actually quite complicated from an engineer point of view. This main hole together with the shape of the absent uh, were interpreted as uh, the church being the tent of the people of Israel, where you know, aside from many interpretations, there's no real distance between form and and between shape and structure. So when Olivetti decided to uh, give his architect. Uh, you know, the commission to build this church. He did it because both Olivetti and Favini shared the uh, period of confinement in Switzerland during World War II. And Favini in particular was part of Colonetti School. But, what, that was an incredible uh, experience of uh, architects sharing uh, and both of their studies were channeled in the publications of the Lausanne University uh, Bulletin. The second aspect to keep in mind is the great collaboration between Favini and the world of architecture, uh, starting from uh, post-war uh, years, especially in the Lombardy region. And one of the most famous examples is the Mater Misericordia uh, in Baranzate Church that he was designing uh, in the same years as he was designing the Sacro Cuore Church. Sacro Cuore is part of the of those churches, They're quite similar in Milan. The he also you know. Uh, almost uh, mentioned some uh, contemporary works on uh, on the surfaces of the of the church. So they you know, projected the um, the bell tower, the chapel, the space for teaching religion. But all of this, all of these spaces um, are linked to the main hall towards the, the use of the triangle that is repeated um, uh, throughout the church by both. Um, both architects' work and attitude with the method that was typical of post-war architects, the Caton Vesco's church is not just unique among churches financed by Olivetti's company. It's also a wonderful example of combination of architect art and design. So Via uh, Crucis was done, was built by Joe Pomodoro. But this experience is that came to an end because in 1960, Adrian Olivetti died. So it was a new season of crisis. So in the final part of our speech, we wanted to understand what, what happened after Adriano's death in Ivrea in the relationship between neighbor and church. So we thought that we, we, it was better to present every single object and regarding its relationship between, between uh, you know, the relationship between um, the object and the surroundings. So in the 60s, there was a change in this relationship between neighborhood and church. So in Canton Vesco, here is a, there's another case study at the beginning of, of, the, of the 50s. They, ha they had two projects that were promoted by the community. The Balisa Temple, 
and the San Francisco uh, Church, the Valesa Temple, the Latin Temple is uh, one of the um, only um, churches like that were built in that area. Uh, actually, Olivetti's grandpa founded the Waldesian uh, church. This, this plot was actually donated by the Olivetti's, and it's between three neighborhoods. The project was taken by um, the two Waldesian uh, um, architects. This building is the application of a space, um, uh, sort of a space uh, project that brings together the ex Catholic Expressionism by Michelucci, who was also working on the church on near the highway in Florence with the Torre Pelliches churches at the time. Of this, together with uh, research for uh, architectural um, expressionism of a German matrix. At the same time, uh, the Catholic community of, in the neighborhood wanted its own church in the church of the in the center of the residential area, built through collaboration uh, in the Olivetti's uh, company. And was commissioned by uh, a priest, Lisa, who uh, actually picked and called all the architects himself. There were the same uh, uh, architects, uh, Adrian Vettis, called to a project, to a design uh, most of the neighborhood. So there were Livadiotti and Giovannini from Rome. The church was built throughout uh, 20 years and with funds coming from the community itself. Uh, services were still uh, connected and the hall for uh, meetings is in the basement of the church. This edifice is a place of worship, it's a almost domestic place of worship. It is part of the, the set of churches that are called uh, house churches. And it's a response to the Sacquatis church. It was much more monumental as a church. In the second part of the 60s, another neighbor in Nivrea called Bella Vista uh, needed a new church. In that case, they, uh, they called uh, the architect Flotti, who uh, designed a huge uh, building at the center of the neighborhood. It was then uh, um, finalized 10 years later. These dynamics uh, align uh, um, Olivetti's uh, debate to then the post Olivetti's one. No, it's, there was a think tank uh, debate and uh, other architects in uh, Japan had a large influence on the construction of these churches, but also if, uh, when it comes to uh, archigrams, uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon archigrams, architects. The definition of new pastoral uh, urban planning considers uh, churches as part of new neighborhoods and new, ch and new cities. It's interesting to see the trajectory of this relationship that ends with a civic center uh, by uh, Sgrelli in Bella Vista. And this, in this building, there's also the, the, there was also a new church that is in the, at the center of the community center. What we wanted to show today is mm -hmm. the importance 
of the position of the church for uh, Ivrea compared to the uh, situation in the country after the Great Reconstruction. And I wanted to underline the importance of Adriano, uh, Adriano's influence, the city and the territory of Ivrea in general become a model of Olivetti's uh, ideas that wouldn't have worked elsewhere. After his death in 1960, there was there were 10 years of realignment. There were um, there then came to uh, something uh, that was actually taken by it was done by Olivetti uh, back then and in the 10 years later. Uh, thank you so much. Grazie a tutti. In particolare, thank you very much. In particular, to the last two speakers, we close this session. So I just wanted to conclude by say something. The number of abstracts that were submitted is very high. What we are seeing here is just a brief selection of the candidates, but you can find every submission in the book of abstract, which is uploaded online, where along with the 10 speeches of today, we have also a set of other more uh, very interesting speeches which couldn't find spaces in the conference due to time constraints. So 20 minutes coffee break and see you at 5 to 12. Europe has a rich and deeply rooted religious heritage. Its unique buildings, tranquil spaces and exquisite artifacts encompass the diversity of European culture and identity. This religious heritage is an invaluable resource that is handed over to us for all generations to enjoy. It is all around us and an integral part of our lives and communities. It includes rich cultural traditions, masterpieces of art, wonderful craftsmanship and extraordinary music. In an era of globalization, cultural heritage helps us to remember our European cultural diversity and its understanding develops mutual respect and contributes to dialogue amongst different cultures. The future of religious heritage presents us with challenges and opportunities. Knowledge transfer and innovation will be needed to hand over this remarkable patrimony to future generations. From the creative reuse of historic buildings, to educational opportunities, from both real and virtual tourism, to strengthening communities, the value of religious heritage is almost limitless. It is up to us to make the most of its potential. Since 2011, Future for Religious Heritage, a European network, has brought together charities, conservation experts, governmental, religious and university institutions, as well as other professionals. FRH is a non-faith, not-for-profit organization that draws its strength from its diverse network. Our mission is to understand the challenges facing religious heritage, as well as the opportunities it presents to develop solutions for the 21st century. Our ambition is to maintain a network of European organizations with a strong structural framework for ongoing intercultural exchanges regarding the protection, conservation, and management of religious heritage. This network is open to you. Please join us now. Please take seat. We need to start the second session. Thank you. I'd like to give the floor to the chair of this session. Thank you. Good morning. Let's open the second part of this morning. I am introducing Laura Lazzaroni. Laura will make a presentation on the presence of secret architecture in Italian uh, magazines since 1950 to 1970. Laura is an architect, especially in monuments restoration. She began collaborating in 2008 with the Office of Culture, Heritage and Secret Art of the Diocese of Milan. Becoming an employee in 2017, in 2021, she obtained a diploma of the advanced training course in architecture, arts and liturgy 
at the Pontifical Institute of Santa Anselmo in Rome. Since October 2021, she has been the delegate of the Diocesan Ordinary for Relationship with the Superintendents and the Diocesan Delegate for Church Buildings for the CEI. Since October, October 2022, she has been a member of the Diocesan Commission Secretary of the Cultural Heritage. So the floor to you. Good morning, everybody. I'm very glad for being here presenting this work, which will explore how much the sacred architecture and the buildings of worship were built 50, 60 years ago. So the period that I've chosen is around the uh, council, so between the end of the Second World War and uh, 1970, uh, the closure due to logistic reasons. I've chosen five journals. Two of them are the base of the old of the period, uh, Arte Cristiana, a journal which is strictly related to a religious Catholic, uh, and Domus, an architecture magazine that is still existing, like Arte Cristiana, which deals with architecture. In this period, these were accompanied by, since it was a very rich period of experience and accounts and the construction of uh, churches and debates, have Fede e Arte, the uh, magazine of the um, Pontifical Commission for Secret Art in Italy, which was edited since 1950. 1967 Chiesa e Quartiere here in Bologna and Nuove Chiese by the Diocese of Milan that was published just for five years at the end of this period. 1969-70 is the end of these experiences. After the Council, many of these publications stopped their publications, stopped their uh, activities. So we are only left with Arte Cristiana and Thomas. So I'm starting from, from the first example. There's a broad debate. And what I want to show you has is the great variety of the uh, submissions, the submissions types, and the choice of architecture. So it's a, a period where a lot was built in Italy. But the first case that we find in magazines, and of which uh, many talk about, is the Vance Chapel by Matisse. Domus is the first presenting it with his article signed by Bruno Cassinari, the painter, who interviewed Matisse while he was still drawing and preparing the sketches for the chapel. And what comes out of it, it's a tale of a joyful space, a prayer space, a space animated by light, by the color that comes in. And it's a narrative, but a positively narrative uh, vision. At the same time, the debate also occurred in other magazines. So there were many points of view, a diverse point of view on art. So Arte Cristiana, after sending its chief editor-in-chief seeing the chapel, Arte Cristiana presented the same place with a far heated, more heated debate. While Domus presented the uh, introduction, Arte Cristiana thought about the orientation, the liturgical poles, the figures that are too rarefied and which do not convey the strength of what they are supposed to represent. And they harshly criticized the positioning of the altar, which is looks like some, uh, some cupboard. So it doesn't have the strength that an altar is supposed to be. This debate is just to tell you how uh, debates were made. So the first topic was modernity and tradition. It's a, hymn, it's a hymn to God sung with the voice of our time. This is what Cardinal Giovanni Costantini, who was the director of the Pontifical Commission of Art Secretary in the first issue of the Fede and Arte Journal, which works on the art and how much and how uh, the church perceives art. So tell the artists and architects what are the guidelines of the central patrons. 
as Lercaro says, each moment in history talks the praise of the living God in the living in the language of the living. So the buildings that we're proposing that uh, uh, moment are very diverse. So I put this uh, bail, which is a uh, very uh, experimental uh, project that will never be completed. A basilica, a sacred space, which is uh, studied with a big size, like in Syracuse or with some very bold structures, which was presented by Domus at first, and then the same pictures of these uh, uh, mock-ups were used also on the book that was edited right after the exhibition that was carried out here in Bologna, which is the one that started the discussions on architecture. The Bologna exhibition collected some case studies of uh, uh, architecture on which to debate because architecture must start following the uh, pace of time. So it's no longer related to a tradition, but it's also related to the how the contemporary society presents itself. Fede e arte documented of uh, what the the Pontifical Commission did with the state funds, so they did this list, they presented the building, which some of them are not uh, still uh, built, so it's just a collection of documents, so they presented the floor plans, the prospects, the mock-ups, so they are all buildings funded by them, the majority are in central and southern Italy. Diocese of Milan, then the Virgin of the Poor, and a couple of other churches but the, by Muzio. But there is this documentary work, so uh, they tell what is being carried out. So contemporary Christian art uh, follows a thread. So they, so they uh, tell the buildings that respond to a tradition which is embedded in modernity, imbued with modernity, but... It's a multiplicity of forms so that it's still linked to a tradition which is not as experimental as the Basilica that we've seen, that we've seen before. The debate uh, occurred on many layers, so I'm just giving you some flashes on the most significant parts of it, but in order to provide you the variety of the opinions, Arte Cristiana, for example, worked on the shape of the buildings, so the orientation of the assembly around the altar. We are still before the council, but all the acquisition of the liturgical movement and all the uh, remarks are set up towards what will be officially expressed in the council. So research on the um, arrangement of the assembly, the shape of the church, if a round church could work or not, and the topic is not just uh, uh, dealt with by uh, Fede Cristiano, but also Arte Cristiano, but also Fede e Arte uh, publishes texts uh, analyzing the components of the Spain. So it's an attention moving from a documentary uh, work, but also a debate on the shapes, spaces, the size of the church, uh, whether to have chapels or not, the uh, orientation, the arrangement of the assembly. And the topic, and the guiding topic is, you, are, you the architect, are the inventor of a new architecture, meeting the need of simplicity, but churches, by uh, removing the old vest, would like to have new vests. Fallani then specified that the tradition still uh, uh, holds. Fallani would take the place or would replace uh, Cardinal Costantino when he, when he died. So it would be the director, the editor in chief of the uh, magazine. And then Fede Arte will publish a set of new works that are very interesting. The debate continued on uh, the. Uh, the magazines that are more related on a more liturgical, ecclesiastic uh, architecture magazine. So Domus, also guided by Ponti. Ponti has a great, as a precise idea of his religiousness and what does it mean to be an architect who deals with churches. And he chose the uh, set of uh, buildings making different choices from what the other editors published. 
this is very well known. This is the Glass uh, Virgin by Mancerotti Morassutti. What I'm interested into is to show you how is it presented. So the presentation of the building is that 20 lines in the first page. So that's a photo reportage, the church by day, church at night, the structures and attention to these uh, construction technique, attention to the space, the final effect. So I'm just pointing out, if you can see it, the altar, that even though this church was done before the uh, council is having different things from an ancient space, an entrance. So Domus shows some pictures narrating a space from uh, the perspective of the, ma of the image. So they give more space to big images. They prefer a sort of storytelling that would uh, involve the people and make them feeling that as if they were inside, taking the right spots of the celebratory aspects. And Ponti specified it in another text, but he repeated it uh, several times that the architect as their own church prays with the prayers. So when the architect, uh, the architect when designing the church is not just an architect, but they become a person that offer an actual religious architecture with this building. So they distinguish any production from the production that is destined to worship. Ponti introduces, introduced a huge number of buildings. The most uh, present in all journals, because the point of contact among journals and magazines basically are not so many as the choices of the works. The works that are on more than two uh, magazines are just a few, and then everybody will pick their own choice because the material was so uh, high, was the availability was so high, so that uh, every editor could have their own line and choose their own, uh, um, their own uh, choices. So this is the monastery, the Carmelo Monastery in Sanremo, but the and it's presented by Ponti, but in the in the magazine called Chiesa e Quartiere. So he presented the space, how he imagined the relationship of the external with the nature, the internal looking outside, the interior looking outside, and the external allowing you to look at the interior, but only what you are only supposed to see. So this is a building in which he tells what it was. Arte Cristiana also talks about the Carmelo and also Domus, even though I didn't bring the images. Some images became the images of a repertoire. The, the picture on the top left, it's more or less the same that we find in all spaces, but each one of them tells the spaces with most text, more images, less images. The narration changes. This is to... Uh... Another example of Domus among uh, among the churches, Ponti decides to present the church of the San Carlo Hospital in Milan, and the photographer uh, and he photographed and he took pictures and then he presented with an introductory text and then he used these images. They are all pictures telling the um, the building during day, the night, opening closures. So it's an architect, it's a journal of architecture. That's what it is supposed to present. But then he also tells about all the central element of the space, the Presbyterian, for example, and at full page, at full column, just to show you this climb in this form that focuses the attention on the altar. Uh, the church by day, by night, the uh, statues of the saints, and speciality. So these are the greatest reportages because the majority of examples is presented in one two page or one or two pages. And that's the topic to build a temple, it's like building ourselves and religion.
and giving its giving back its essence. Che dia non essenza, uno spazio. In this series of spaces, there's a space of religion. So Domus published this chapel in Turin, which does not exist any longer. The Leonardo Mosso Chapel. It's a spiritual space of prayer. So the choice ranges from the uh, basilica to the parish church to the chapel and the chapel of the neighborhood, but which contains a set of works of art. This is a chapel in QT8 district in Milan within a, uh, a small a small community in Milan, which is a, a remote place, but he focused the three interesting points. So the art works that could define the space. Chiesa e quartiere does not limit itself to parish churches, even though it this is may this is its main uh, topic. But they also presented this chapel in Milan, which does not exist anymore, uh, of a nun institute made by an artist and an architect. Just to see the overlapping of topics, there is also the topic of the places, the poles of celebration. So Arte Cristiana wrote entire articles presenting some spaces that in the majority of cases are carried out by their own architects or by let's say, the, the context of which it recognizes certain visions. So the uh, example of the Beato Angelico. So it's a model. Its own model of reference itself. Sfede e Arte does something different. Before the council tells, on the one hand, all the uh, monographies on uh, uh, foreign churches in Europe, so French churches, German churches, publishing some great reportages. And then it focuses on liturgic poles. So in this case, Monsignor Fallani is the author and he tells, uh, and he makes the history of the central pole, the altar, and then some case studies. I'm not interested in individual cases, but I'm interested in, in to seeing that it's a classification of types of altars that can be found all over Europe. So it's, his references are not just related to a single cultural environment, which could be uh, Rome or those produ produced by the Holy See, but he roamed all over Europe. Milan is one of the hubs. It's called the uh, construction site of the Archbishop. The, uh, it's the title of a book dedicated to the city because it's one of the center of the Italy, where the production of churches was concentrated. I don't know how many churches were built, and I don't know how many were presented in magazines, because there's an open debate in which, well, one thing are the article or the technical sheets for single building, and another thing are the uh, pictures put in uh, other texts or in book reviews. But the construction effort was huge, so you have these lists, and new churches becomes the uh, magazine of the, of the diocese, diocese collecting funds and raising awareness on the pastoral and the presence of churches in the city. These, I'm not interested in reading these two schemes, but it's, I would like to show you how much the, the building in the diocese of Milan are not just presented on all, on all magazine, but one in the magazine, another in, in another one. So there is... A, a comprehensive coverage of what happens there. This is the church in Rescaldina. There's also an attention to another uh, magazine on what happens in Milan. Chiesa Quartiere documented single individual building, then they uh, published a book on that. And Fede Arte made an overview, so presenting all the churches and and then a, a, with a homage to Montini, which would be Paul, Paul, Paul VI. So he, they presented all the churches approved by uh, the then Cardinal Montini. So I'm not interested in documenting how they were done. So, but it's an effort to 
to let's say pay a tribute to the constructive effort domus then tells the buildings with the mock-ups with the scales with a more architectural perspective final point final point arte christiana at the end of the 60s talk about the churches that weren't mentioned before so the churches that the weren't of its of its production or in the environment. So the, it's about the relationship with the urban environment. So the Church of Balanzate, Ponte Fupoligno, this church which is in the city with, in relation with the relationship with the context, and the church by Arrighetti, the pointed church within the uh, neighborhood, which was built by the municipality of Milan. And Arrighetti and Arrighetti put the. Um, church in the district the final one is the church on the motorway which is the other example together with Nashempo about which everybody talk about it and also Madonna Misericordia di Balanzate and here with different ideas because those who enthusiastically welcomed it like Ponte said Mich Michelucci can die happy he has a, a quartiere talks about it in an enthusiastic way Arte Cristiana quite enthusiastic the least satisfied with that was the pontifical commission saying that it won't be a church or it will be a set which is out of scale that everybody will go to see but you won't collect a community around it the the end of the season was given by domus so we got to the end of the 60s, Chiesa Equatere was closed, Fede e Arte would close because uh, the, con the council ended, so its work ended. That's what they wrote in the last issue. So they uh, ended with their effort in uh, training architects and liturgists to art. So you have utopian architectures like this Moretti's project for a cathedral in the desert and Pontis country Cathedral from Taranto, which in 1970s was old, was still being built, but a society must have a temple at the center representing the divine mystery of life against the ferociousness of uh, humans. Church needs art, and I think it is the trade union of this uh, work. And finally, I would like to leave the last word to Montini. When presenting the churches he did in Milan, he said, I hope that eyes will be indulgent because there is a variety of things produced that are, that are not all equal, not of the same quality, and not all of them respond to the idea of that time. But I hope that observing eyes looking at these churches would see a projection towards the future so that they understand that that's something that we've did today for the future. And this is the conclusion of this topic. Magazines told the story of their moment and tried to teach and raise awareness on the efforts that were made in these years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, for your uh, journey around Italy. Now let's move even northern be made by two colleagues, Chiara and uh, Femke. They are coming from Netherlands. Chiara um, obtained in Germany, sorry. Belgium, sorry. <laughs> Netherlands, it's almost the same. No, no, it's not. <laughs> so um, they are bringing us this, this, communicate, this article about constructing a modern image, the representation on, of post-war churches in Belgian peri periodicals. Chiara obtained their degree as a Master of Science in Architectural Engineering at the University of Ghent in 2022 with a Master Thesis on Flemish Beginage. In 2023, she joined the Architectural Engineer Lab of WUB, where she examines the construction history and heritage value of roof structures of post-war churches. This is the work they are you are making together, from what I've understood. Pemken van der Mullen is a PhD, also a PhD researcher at the Faculty of Architecture of the University of Louvain. In 2023, she graduated with a Master of Architecture in Louvain also. After the, the graduation, she joined this research group and this, this research project, Meaning and Material, under the supervision of the, the professors, our colleagues architects, Sven Sterken and also Stephanie van der Boort. Uh, they are also co-authors of this article that is going to be published. So thank you.
All right. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to present today. Uh, so today we will talk about a part of our project that focuses on how the image of post-war churches was constructed literally and figuratively by using the methodology of analyzing different post-war journals. So coming from a Belgian context, we see that France was presented in Belgium as the birthplace of modern architecture. When reading through these uh, periodicals, we received the same narrative for modern church architecture. One of these articles is uh, Joseph Pichard's uh, Église des Mois, or uh, Church Witnesses, uh, written in the Belgian periodical of La Maison. Uh, he focuses on church buildings as the manifestation of their time, their lit uh, liturgical views, and how this is translated within the architecture and construction of the building. Bichard defines two main witnesses for this um, decades leading up to the Port Sword period. So as a first witness, we uh, see that he presents like the Notre Dame de Racine from uh, Auguste Perret as the starting point of modern church architecture. The Notre Dame was the first church in which the concrete construction was left visible. Although this was very innovative, the Notre Dame followed a very traditional basilica plan, uh, conforming to a more pragmatic approach to liturgy. So as a second change within contemporary religious architecture, this can be illustrated with the construction of the chapel, the chapel of uh, Ronchamp from Le Corbusier. Um, uh, Ronchamp is famous for its innovative architectural languages that enhances a new form of liturgy of the time. However, the construction aspect, which was also innovative, is never really shown. So we then come to our period of uh, research. So starting at 1955, right after Ronchamp was built, this period was quite significant for religious architecture and especially in Belgium, uh, because the country was then almost entirely Catholic and uh, faced rapid demographic growth after the Second World War. Um, the Expo of 85 in Brussels stimulated then constructive innovation and the Pro Arte Christiana competition of 95 uh, formed the start of modern church building there. So Vatican II also took place during this period. And then uh, we limited it to, until 1970, where we see like a short decline in the construction of church buildings due to the secularization of society in Belgium. So while looking at the two uh, previous witnesses, the relation between liturgy, architecture, and construction is not always complementary. So according to the architect article of Pichard, there is a shift in focus there between uh, these three um, fields. The role of construction seems to become more prominent in this period to enhance the spatial and liturgical qualities of a church. So we wonder if there is like a third witness we can find in this period. Um, that defines like the religious architecture of that time and that was praised like equally from all three aspects. So this leads us to the research question, how is the image of these post-war post churches literally and figuratively constructed? So to answer this question, we decided to draw upon a selection of national and international periodicals, because during this post-war period, periodicals were a common reference point for architectures. They were accessible through an accessible source of inspiration that laid around in the office or even at home at the coffee table. Uh, so for us, they are a very valuable resource, almost like as much as archive material, since they reflect like the building culture and values of that time. Most of the ones uh, we will discuss end around 1970s, which was also uh, shown in the previous uh, presentation, and so aligns then also with uh, our research periods. So for our selection, we chose to work with six periodicals to get a broader overview of which church buildings were represented in that period to the Belgian audience. So to have enough variety between these periodicals, we chose to analyze a national and an international periodical with a specific focus or these fields we mentioned before. So for the liturgical um, periodicals, we analyzed Art d'Église et Art Chrétien. Um, we also read La Maison et l'Architecture d'aujourd'hui for that were more prominent um, architectural periodicals of the time. For the more technical periodicals, we reviewed uh, La Technique des Travaux et Technique et Architecture. Uh, as you can see, the international periodicals are originally from, from France, all three. Uh, this is not a coincidence since French periodicals were often read by Belgians due to its proximity, but also because there was no language barrier. Uh, besides that, France was also a very prominent reference for Belgian architecture in that time. So to answer our research question, we looked at three different aspects that contribute to the construction of this image of these post-war churches. So at first we asked ourselves how often were and which churches buildings were represented in these periodicals. 
So from the 597 issues that we analyzed, we found 894 churches. We also noticed uh, several peaks with a sharp decline in 1966, which, which is when the periodical Art Critique uh, stopped publishing. And it was also a bit before the first secularization wave in Belgium and in Western Europe. Uh, we see that um, international churches were featured more often than Belgian churches. They were a bit marginalized within these um, periodicals, even in the Belgian ones, until the late 60s when La Maison published a special edition on Belgian religious architecture. And it shows that Belgium was a bit later within its development and acknowledgement of modern religious architecture to compare to other countries. So most periodicals focused on French examples. This is not only because French periodicals were deliberately shown as national, uh, shown national examples to more promote their church building campaign, but um, this was also because Belgian periodicals focused on France as a reference point as well. Uh, however, the quantitative analysis doesn't always uh, represent the qualitative uh, analysis since churches not always were discussed very elaborately. As shown here, most of the times they were only used as a reference in a broader or more general article. Um, they were also often featured in short articles that listed like the more practical information about the churches, so the program, the plan, uh, and sometimes even a mention of the construction. So their image was presented present quite often, but this image lacked detailed information about the literal construction of the image. When looking in the different types of periodicals, we see that the litur liturgical periodicals, as expected, featured a lot of churches, the architectural a bit less, and then the technical periodicals even less, as churches were not seen as a typical building assignment of the time. However, when they were elaborately discussed in full artic articles, their construction was always mentioned most of the time. In technical periodicals, the whole building process, technical cal calculations, images of the construction site of each case are mentioned. Architectural periodicals often mention the construction of a church building and even have several articles devoted to the work of an engineer or to the construction of a church building. We were surprised to see that even in liturgical periodicals, the construction was shortly discussed. We sometimes found even a technical note by the architect, other times just a few sentences, but it gives us a more tact tactile or material dimension to the building that is otherwise just presented as an image. So to conclude this first aspect, we see that there was a strong focus on French church buildings. So in line with the idea of Pichard's article, um, considering the large volume of all these periodicals, the number of published churches remains quite low. Uh, the number of publications about church architecture slowly increased and then rapidly decreased within a research period. So the second aspect we investigated is to which degree was the literally construction of these churches seen as an int integral part within the whole project. So how was the complete image constructed? Meaning which churches were not only praised from a liturgical and architectural, but also from a technical point of view. So by comparing the periodicals from different fields with each other, we found several churches and other religious architecture that were represented in every three fields. So as mentioned before, mainly French examples, as you can see, um, were represented. So to give you an example of a maybe larger um, cathedral that was featured within all three, we will discuss the Basilique du Sacre Coeur from Algeria. Uh, the typology of the basilica and the cathedral are interesting from a liturgical point of view because it was broadly discussed uh, back then whether uh, religious buildings of this scale were needed. It was also uh, praised for its innovative construction of, as one of the best cases of reinforced concrete and the good collaboration between the architect and engineer, especially because it was um, calculated by René Chargé, which uh, who was a famous uh, French engineer who was also responsible for many uh, large French public projects, such, such as the uh, Cathedral of Royan. So then a smaller example um, that was featured in all three is the Notre Dame de la Paix uh, from Arneville in France. Uh, these uh, smaller French parish churches were often featured, especially in Arc uh, that documented uh, every church that was built or was going to be built in the different dioceses of France. Um, as seen in this example, they used 
uh, construction images, but didn't further explain within the article itself, um, which were the constructive aspects of the church. So the focus was more on the building of new churches than on the constructive aspects. In other um, periodicals, the churches then are only briefly discussed. Um, the Belgian churches, on the other hand, weren't really discussed at all, um, unless there were articles on a certain architect or just as a reference. Um, only two times they were um, referenced in an international uh, periodical. The one that uh, was featured in the three fields was the pavilion of Civitas Dei at the Expo of 85 in Brussels, um, mainly because the World Expo of 85 was uh, generously documented, including all the pavilions that were there, um, while also having a very interesting uh, cable construction that gives this sort of tent form, um, um, only like the, the the liturgical aspect of this tent form that refers to like the ancient tent uh, where people gathered um, is elaborately discussed. Next example is the Notre Dame de Stockholm in a, in the suburban suburbs of Brussels. It was the only um, Belgian church that was mentioned in a technical periodical um, where it was uh, appraised praised for its use of a prefabricated reinforced concrete, um, whilst at the same time sort of standing in this long tradition, um, liturgical tradition. Um, yet, even in this more technical uh, periodical, even though all the construction is being described, it's mainly described for its beautiful aesthetics. Um, so, um, but on the other hand, in the architectural periodical, the actors, for example, the contractor and the manufacturer are being um, are left visible, which is kind of interesting to see how this network of, of, of people around the building starts to um, unravel. Another Belgian project is the Monastery of the Clarisse in Ostende, um, which was the only Belgian example that was noticed on an international level um, due to the close co collaboration between the sisters and the, the nuns and the architect, um, and which resulted in a very um, in, in simplicity of materials and sort of honesty of materials and was seen as characteristic for this project. Um, this resulted in a very humble project. Similarly, uh, we have uh, Notre Dame de Sartonfagne in Wallonia, built by Roger Bastin. Um, which by uh, several Belgian periodicals is seen as um, a best practice, uh, a best example of what a contemporary church should be. Yet it's a very simple building. It's it's not that, like, you know, uh, uh, on inno innovative on a construction uh, constructive level. It's it's very simple, and I think a lot of uh, we think a lot of um, Belgian churches were sort of striving for that simplicity whilst not like being uh, crazy innovative uh, regarding construction. So to conclude the second aspect, um, so there was not only a focus on French churches, but also on large scale projects. And only in these large scale projects was the construction like elaborately discussed in the smaller scale projects. It's more about the architecture and the liturgy. Um, it makes sense that the, the, the large scale uh, projects um, are, are appraised for their constructive aspect because um, they were only possible due to uh, new developments uh, with reinforced concrete, for example, um, and the, the, the emergence of the actor of the engineer. How the churches are represented differs from periodical to periodical. Um, there's always like sort of a, a specific focus traceable in these articles, but the construction of the whole image of all these aspects of the church um, is only visible when there's an overlap um, between the different periodicals. Then we come to a third point where we uh, ask ourselves, so we're looking at the construction of the modern image, but who constructed this image? Who was behind this construction of uh, the modern church? and how were they portrayed and how did they perhaps portray themselves. So we tried to um, look at the different actors that um, were involved in the construction of a church and um, noticed these six figures, the architect, the contractor, the engineer, the church authorities and the community uh, manufacturers and then the construction laborers. 
so um, even though the church authorities play a very active role in the church building process and in the guidelines that were set for the church, they are only visible in images uh, in the mass, uh, not really in the uh, building process. The community, however, is, is, is only uh, seen as sort of passive actor. It's never really mentioned as if the community took part in um, the building process or in the, in the, in the decision making. Um, then the architect, once a church is built, it's often attributed to an architect, a sort of designer of a building. That's why they're always like the first one to be mentioned uh, after the name of the church. In some cases, um, they claim more space by um, explaining the building themselves. And we noticed that when they explain the building themselves, they start to like also explain this building process and how the decisions were made, which materials they used. So it gives a much more tactile idea of the church. It makes it more a, a, a living thing rather than just a flat image. Um, then the two, uh, uh, two next actors are the contractor and the engineer. Um, the, the, the fact that churches were built on such a uh, big scale it was like this big church uh, building campaign, especially in Belgium and also in France, we saw this. This was only possible due to the close collaboration between architect, engineer and contractor. Um, yet it's only the architect that gets uh, noticed most of the time. Um, sometimes the contractor and the engineer are mentioned um, like under the, the name of the church, sometimes at the end of the article, but very often not. Um, we notice that sometimes the contractor um, tries to like claim space by um, putting an advertisement in uh, the periodical where the project was already mentioned to make themselves like visible and and use this church as a sort of reference and like portray themselves as uh, church builders. Um, then the manufacturers um, to build a church you need material <laughs> in the post-war period. Um, a lot of lot of innovative building materials came into light, such as um, reinforced concrete, laminated timber, steel sp space frames, and um, it's you need people to produce them or, um, to be able to assemble them on the construction site, and these were the manufacturers, um, and very often they are not uh, mentioned, they are not acknowledged, maybe like in a short sentence. Um, but it's, we notice that sometimes they start to take up more place, uh, similarly to the contractors in the advertisements. Um, they start to portray their work in relation to certain churches, sometimes just naming the church, sometimes just saying churches, and sometimes uh, in a more graphical manner um, by showing the church they built. For example, the, um, the example on the left, uh, on the top left, is uh, the Kuhne who is a Belgian fabricant of uh, laminated timber, uh, making this whole building process of the church so much easier because he sort of provided this structure to the site and then it just had to be assembled. Um, so uh, taking some weight off the shoulders of the architects and the engineers. Um, yeah. Then last but not least, the construction laborers, these were the ones who actually built the church, who took the materials and made them into a church under guidance of the engineer and architect, of course. Um, we noticed that they were only um, featured in images, they were never really mentioned, but the, the images always kind of give a very staged feeling as if, you know, they're working on this church. It's like a sort of pride or a sort of effort goes into this church. It's very nice to see um, how this church building process is, is put into images. So the conclusion for this part, <laughs> um, even though the architect remains the most highlighted figure of a church, um, we, there's, there's, we noticed how all these other actors are more or less sometimes mentioned in these periodicals, but it's, it's a sort of network that it's very difficult to unravel because they're not always acknowledged as much as they should. Um, so for us, um, oh no, um, and one aspect we didn't really look at uh, yet because we didn't have uh, enough time or it's not really our focus is the influence of the editorials who, of course, both the images in uh, the uh, periodicals who decided what churches to put there. Um, we know, for example, in Belgium, there's sometimes 
the editorials are the architects of the buildings, but uh, we don't have enough information for the French ones. Um, yeah, and then to conclude the whole uh, presentation, um, we, in an attempt to sort of link this materiality, this construction process to the meaning of what a church uh, was, we try to unravel this whole network of actors of, of construction um, by looking in the periodicals. Uh, we know we already found quite a lot, but there's still a lot more to um, to be looked into. So I think uh, it was an, a great starting point for us, but we noticed how we need more uh, research in order to kind of get that whole network and how this image of, of, of what a modern church should be, which in the Belgian context was often French churches, like actually came to the Belgian architects and how they use that information or, or to, to build their own churches. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to give you the word to Lorenzo Greco. Uh, Lorenzo is going to present us with a this research on parish and people advancements within Anglican parish churches in post-war Britain. So after visiting Belgium, not Netherlands, sorry for the mistake again, we are going to the north and we are going to visit Britain. Lorenzo holds a PhD in civil engineering, architecture and construction from the University of Roma Tor Vergata and in architecture from the University of Can Canterbury. Specializing in architectural history, his doctoral research focused on post-war um, post ecclesiastical architecture in Britain. With expertise in Renaissance, early 20th century, and contemporary architecture, he explores the technological and propaganda aspects within architectural projects. He is currently a researcher fellow at the University of Roma Tor Vergata. Lorenzo, take your time. So thank you for the opportunity to speak in this rich Congress. And uh, I will say that despite the English title of my contribution and the English text that you will find in the presentation, I'm going to speak in Italian. So I call the English speakers. Part. Um, nel periodo... Uh, in the post-war post period, both the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England uh, underwent profound transformations spurred by the influence of the liturgical movement within the Church of England. Uh, it was quite clear when it comes to a uh, design of parishes between the 50s and the 70s, and there were actual instruments to uh, involve local communities. Here you see a summary of my speech that first of all, it focuses on the context that brought Anglican churches in involving uh, the community in its rituals and in, in the relationship between the buildings and its liturgic uh, rituals. In the second part, we uh, consider the urban context of, uh, of new towns, and especially when it comes to uh, acquiring new uh, extra liturgic um, rituals in the so-called dual purpose churches, then we go to multi-purpose uh, churches, uh, exemplified by the uh, St. Philip and James uh, churches in Birmingham. And then we go to the Ecumen Ecumenical Center in Skemsdale, which represents the idea of um, putting together not just uh, lots of different functions, but uh, lots of different religions. So what we're going to see in the, few min in the next few minutes is about space becoming a criterion for uh, designing a project. Also to create a sense of community by creating, uh, by building these worship sites. So in order to understand this um, evolution, the evolution of this community in the liturgical aspect of it, I put some um, I put some pieces of literature that were impactful at the time. So we see in the first part of the 20th century, a 
renewal and uh, change in the architecture at the time uh, with a drive coming, especially from the Anglican Church, especially from the Yeah, you know, uh, we studied the, um, the the architecture at the time, and this was another movement that uh, brought together uh, clergy people that wanted to uh, re rebirth of religious orders that were suppressed by Henry VIII. It's not a coincidence that still. In the early part of the 20th century, uh, renewal movements of Anglican liturgy that, uh, came about in, in a, of course, following a international context are developed within re the religious orders. For example, Gregory Dix that wrote The Shape of Liturgy, you see on the right, who insisted on the form of liturgy uh, you know, individuating for a part of the uh, this this liturgy, Dix's work has great influence on the uh, the reform of Anglican liturgy, and also of the so-called parish communion. The parish communion movement uh, was born in the in in the um, in, four, in the early forties. In particular, it's the parish communion they see on the right, published in 1937. It's the body of the parish, and especially the so-called uh, uh, parish and people that was a bulletin published by this uh, organization. It promotes uh, a sort of ethic, still, uh, uh, you know, uh, supporting a sense of communion but also wanted to change the the Sunday Mass involving churchgoers even more. So then, together with the uh, communion at the, in the morning and then the Mass at, the ele at 11, they wanted also to have a more sort of involving Mass at uh, 9 in the morning that is... Focus more on the focus more on the community. So there's music and there's more of an active participation from churchgoers. This mass is particularly modern. Was still particularly modern uh, in the post-war period. In fact, the uh, the the um, evangelic uh, evangelic mission in England became. Uh, the norm at the time. So in the parish communion that we see on the right, together with the so-called uh, parish communal that we just talked about, they they also talk about the so-called parish breakfast. So uh, a meal organized after the Sunday's mass with the purpose of building the social life of the parish that is usually hosted in the holes that were built nearby the church. So the consequences of the exchange were particularly evident in the architecture. And together with what is happening, uh, what was happening in Catholic architecture, also in the Anglican churches, the altar became central. So at the same time, the uh, the forest part uh, became uh, fundamental. A great example was the St. Paul Bocommon in the East End in London, Bocommon, sorry, uh, opened in the 60s. It was uh, uh, built by Robert Maguire, Keith Murray. There was part of the new uh, church research group that is an interdisciplinary and multi religious group that studies uh, liturgy and architecture, but it they're also the architects and the writers of the magazine Church Buildings. The church that you see here that is considered the masterpiece of uh, British uh, arch ecclesial architecture is also um, 
celebrated by Peter Hammond, who is the famous author of Literature, Literature and Architecture, which is a book that was rather influential for uh, uh, English architects, first published in 1960. The church as a functional plan for the life of the community with the rectangular plan with with another uh, part of it and the right and then it's only stopped by the um, baptism area. Then we see a, also a churchyard and then there's the the parish house on in the north and south there's a meeting area. The yard itself adapts itself to the different uses or that you know were useful for the community. The parish space is quite useful, and that's quite evident in a uh, development area with new and uh, areas that were used uh, that were favored by the housing hawk, the, the housing act in 1952. The rapid uh, increase and turnover of the population made it impossible to have a parish system straight away that asked for a, a clear um, a relationship, a close relationship between the people and the church in order to have a sort of shared um, a sh you know, shared um, intention. You had uh, priests working with local authorities in order to uh, have the the, um, the context in order to build a church there. So in order to have a permanent church in the first generation new towns that were mostly uh, not, but not very populated, you, you see the churches being more of a, in a peripheral area. And that of course made it uh, more cost effective because it costed less and mostly financed through uh, local uh, and community, uh, uh, community funds. These contexts, the church was fundamental by integrated the sacred space with uh, non liturgic um, activities. And there were two different ways of conceiving churches and their parish centers. The first method is seeing the church as a, a, just a worship uh, place and a and once that the church uh, you know, be a sort of monument in the city, and also by representing a sort of sacred form of beauty for the community. So the churches should resemble more the Greek cathedrals in order not to um, prevent uh, locals from um, interacting with art. But at the same time, they doubted the will of believers to go to uh, classic parish centers also uh, on the other days of the week. The liturgic space is still autonomous, but uh, non-religious functions were uh, done in other smaller uh, buildings near the church in a second moment. And... Jared Goddard actually defended this idea that projected the um, Fatima's uh, Our Lady and okay, together with the St. Paul Church, their clear landmark that is completely separated from the uh, parish complex in the, which is at the back of the, of the church that integrates the parish complex with the church, which is a multi-house building. The solution is useful in order to have more cost-effective, uh, to to reduce to reduce the cost of the buildings. Uh, dual so dual-purpose church, um, as the name suggests, are more than one use. They were quite typical after the post uh, in the post-war period in England, and they uh, have a major hall with the sanctuary. At, at the edge that can be blocked uh, 
when there's there are non-religious activities going on. For example, in uh, Anglican, a church built by uh, 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 um, Maguire and Murray in Harlow, or for example, the, the one you see on the left, built by uh, Michael Farray in the suburban uh, in the suburbia of London. These functions can be integrated in different ways, as you can see here in these um, drawings here. So the having multiple activities in one places in one place means having uh, flexible um, buildings that can be or reorganized in different ways. Even the change of uh, people's background, cultural background, uh, pushed to have a different uh to different buildings uh, that were less monumental but more functional all well, this is translates into um um you know not favoring beauty as much but having a more flexible internal areas Having uh, non-religious and religious uh, activities in one place it is at the base of polyfunctional, uh, uh, multifunctional churches. The term is used to describe uh, St. Philip and St. James Church, that is an Anglican church, completed in 1968 in, a, in the suburbs of Birmingham that was then demolished in 2008. The main difference between the multi-purpose church uh, and the dual-purpose church is how the um, the place are uh, are used. For example, the non-liturgical areas are not separated from the liturgical areas during uh, the mass. The project that you see on the right, done by uh, Martin Birdie. It's a result of a joint action of the Institute of the Study of Worship and Religious Architecture of the University of Birmingham, directed by John Gordon Davis, together with uh, students and, profess and professors in, in this university. In those same years, Davis was working uh, at the Secular Use of Church Building. It was one of his books. And through a circle reconstruction, so they were quite actually partial, partial. He reviewed all sorts of activities that were done in churches, something that should be done again in modern Anglican uh, churches. So, um, multifunctional uh, functional places are fundamental for the purposes of Ang of the Anglican Church uh, after the World War II. The original project had a church hall being uh, preserved that could be used for non-religious activities. Although in 1966, there was a fire that destroyed this building completely. And so they rethought all of its functions that, are, that were now integrated uh, much more organically in one place. The new plan is created through uh, putting uh, rectangles together with um, roofs that uh, permit light uh, to uh, enter the building. Although these um, the volume here at the the area here at the east as a bar, then there's a, a game area. Then there's a huge um, uh, hole that can be connected to the, the the religious area of the building. And behind the altar, there are just little small spaces with a quiet room and the sacristy. And then there's a corridor that uh, leads to the house of the priest for the altar towards the east part of the plan, there's a, a worship space that can be uh, enhanced then later. There's been a long a preparatory um, uh, project that 
it was uh, the you know prevented all sorts of the you know thought of all sorts of activities, surveys, um, uh, exhibitions, etc. In order to establish the main purposes of the building, there was a diagram that was realized together with uh, churchgoers, and that is the was the program of the project. The definition of the activities that could be done in the uh, liturgical area were quite well defined. The principle is that the, all secular activities. can be uh, done in front of the altar. So the theatrical plays, cons uh, theater plays, concerts, uh, games, uh, gymnastics. I'll quickly move to uh, this slide because we don't have time. Just to say that flexibility and multifunctionality were fundamental and it was the missionary uh, plan that, that wanted to institute some pastoral um, uh, pastoral organizations that are connected to maybe a specific church or to ecumenical center that represent the whole com Christian community. This change is due to the, the social change in England uh, with immigration, uh, the post-colonial uh, immigration that led to uh, the realization of first e ecumenical centers. For example, one that you see here uh, by Martin Porti, by Martin Purdy, which were answers to some economic economic issues because they make the mo they made the most of the building, and they also ref it also reflected the changes. In, uh, in in England at the time. So there are four churches, Methodistic, one, but also the Catholic and the Anglican Church. And it's also a community center. So I'll be quick. So this is to show you the uh, floor plan, saying ecumenical center in these images. We have some activities that are carried out by changing the internal space, by moving the furniture, which is mobile furniture. So let's go quickly to the conclusions just to tell you that this journey through the Anglican churches and Paris centers are integrated in the same churches, such as some topics that are still current, as we've seen during this conference. And most of all, <clears throat> And then what, what happens with other confessions, the transformation of religion with, from a private approach like the Anglican ritual in the 19th century to a community action leads to rethinking the liturgical space and the integration of new aggregations, community aggregation spaces. This is a process that had a gradual stop in the, the different development halfway through the 70s when the city centers are increasingly characterized by shopping malls and not by religious roles, while no space is left to religious buildings that are relegated to peripheral areas and start competing with the actual community centers carried out in this newly developed area. So thank you very much for your attention. Grazie Lorenzo. Adesso... Thank you very much, Lorenzo. We have some bit of time. So, Giovanni, can we have a round of debate? So, I would like to call the speakers on stage of the morning session and then we can proceed. So, old morning speakers, Chiara. So I'd like to invite the floor to ask questions or to make remarks. So we have 50, more or less 15 minutes before the lunch break. So 
there had been a debate, a very enriching debate uh, during the uh, coffee break. So I'd like you to, you know, to express the debates that we've had. Also among the speakers, obviously. So you know that Olivetti built villages all over Italy. And as far as I know, but I don't know much about it, you might know more about it. The parish church is not present in other Olivetti village. I'm thinking about Pozzuoli near Naples. And it's a smaller one in Caserta, which is still interesting. And these are some examples that could be appreciated also from the perspective of the architecture, but there's no presence of the church because among the architect, his architect is Luigi Cosenza, which is as, I mean, he is very far from the Catholic church because he was a militant in the Italian Communist Party and is the uh, alter ego of Canino. Canino represented the conservatives and the political world which was related to the Christian Democrats in the post-war Italy, while Cosenza will be, I guess, he resigned as a university professor because he didn't accept some logic. So I understand that Cosenza would have not uh, designed a, a chapel or a church. But as far as you know, apart from the examples that you showed, in Ivrea, are there other experiments in uh, the Olivetti villages or centers, if you know about that? Otherwise, uh, we will see, I mean. Actually, this is a topic that we need to deal uh, with. This is the first a uh, survey on what happened to Ivrea, which is the city of Adriano. We've never dealt with religious architecture vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the uh, Olivetti company. We started working in Ivrea because, for a macroscopic question, because in Ivrea there was the actual building of a church. About Pozzuoli, I think it wasn't envis envisaged. Even though the village was not completed because a big part for the executive in the south was left. Marcianese came much later, so we talk about 1968, so Olivetti's intervention was far less because it was outsourced to other local entities. Well, Massa Carrara, once again, there's no church. But it's not a, a completely new neighborhood as it happens in Ivrea. It's within a historical neighborhood. But this is a first start. We'll need to understand what happened in the rest of Italy, in the rest of the world. And I uh, refer to Brazil and Argentina, where Olivetti built new residential uh, towns. In Argentina, there's this social service component, but I don't think there's a church there. But once again, this is something that we need to make some need to research. So the presence of churches in company towns might be another topic to study because the company towns I know well, Sometimes it's at the center, sometimes it's not there. So that might be interesting. Well, I've had just some reflection to connect yesterday's session to today. There's a first reflection which I would like to invite you to think 
And it's this. So I think that the years that are being represented by the speakers of today's session, that as you can see, they are all experiences that are shifted towards the, uh, well, not the first half, but the post-war. Both in the, uh, more in the third quarter of the century rather than the fourth a quarter of the past century, I think that there was an enthusiasm, a clear enthusiasm, which is material, which is social, the experimentation of new materials to renew some form. So there was something, and that something had a clear definition, a more, a more or less evident Definition. Now, I think that we have the opposite paradox. So actually, we need to question ourselves on that original form, which is no longer clear. And I'd say that given this debate is uh, ma as pluriversal, so it's not universal, it's individualized. And now I think that this is a topic that blew up in 50 years. It measures the social... and cultural difference that we are facing today. So paradoxically, we might say that we have infinite materials than what our predecessors had. I'm thinking about the instrumental material, social debate. We have the internet, the communication, communication material. So a lot of material, but what's the uh, aim, what's the purpose of them? Well, this is some food for thought that I think we are missing. And this is so broad as a topic that I do not expect this debate to, on this 10 menus can uh, solve. I mean, I'm just underlining it as a vibration, as an input. But that is another topic on which we can act. Uh, so with some answers, which in my opinion, it's a question that the last speech asks. So we've seen these spaces of Anglican of Anglican churches that are strongly aimed at welcome other activities than the liturgical one. And you, Lorenzo, call them multifunctional spaces. And also in English, this is the uh, word that's used. So we need to grasp, and we have Albert Gerard here, we need to grasp a theological difference between the concept of multifunction about which you talked about and you uh, also made evident and the concept of hybridation. So a hybridized space, which is available for hybridation, which is the one that in this moment, is considered as a potential model for German churches. So there must be a point where you have a difference either in uh, the acquired function. So is there a limit on acquired function? So the tennis court is great, the limit of acquired functions, or if it's there a distinction a theological distinction between the word hybridation and the multi-space, multi-purposeness. So I don't know if you've you've dealt with these aspects in your research and if you can shed light on the, on that. I don't know who to give the microphone actually. Alberto, do you want to take the floor? I can't answer this precise question from a theological perspective. And I leave the uh, floor to Professor Gerrard, who will be much skilled than me. But I can just say that by researching this space is going from the dual purpose church, which has more purposes, but it has a two ex mutually excluding purposes, so liturgic religious function or the extra liturgic uh, function of uh, 
moments and spaces that are similar but separated because you screen the altar, you screen the source, and you turn the church into a theater. In this case of multipurpose church, which is a concept coming from Gordon Davis, who is the author of the secularism of church buildings, it's the idea that these uh, uses are not contradictory, so they can be put together, and there's a debate with the uh, faithful on what on uh, which uses we can make. I was very brief. So it, all uses that are admitted in uh, the ordinary life of a Christian uh, are admitted. So if it's if for a Christian it's listed to, to dine at his own uh, home, well, they can do it also in front of an altar. This was the final summary. But there is a broad debate which is in parallel in the same years with the debate that is going on in England on the legitimate uses for the transformation and the, and the conversion of churches. So that's all the topic of church conversion. So can you turn the church into a library? Is that a legitimate use? Well, usually yes, but they can't be turned into a discotheque, for example. But, uh, you know, we have many uh, institutions that were turned into nightclubs or similar um, activities. So also allowed uses is another debate which is much more open. And probably it's a different approach from what the Catholic Church has had in the same years. So it's also due to the fact that the Anglican clergy... comes from a different social context and probably the idea of the celibate of the clergy is intended in another way along with the participation of the clergy in the social life. But Professor Gerhardt, well, do we have another microphone? Just a, just a couple of words because yesterday I didn't show the last example of a church in my parish. Those who visit me know it, St. Francis. So we have five churches in my parish in Bonn, in St. Peter's Parish. Three churches in the neo-Gothic style, one of the fifth from the 50s, and two from the 70s. 60s, one of them is a church which is called the Church of Dialogue between Culture and Liturgy, between Liturgy and Culture, sorry, a uh, church that is not deconsecrated, but where liturgy doesn't happen anymore, it's just a non-Eucharistic mass, but a non-Eucharistic liturgy once in a month, but there are many other uh, events, concerts, dancing, many things during the year. At least, well, before the pandemic, like 150 uh, events per year. So the church is not uh, deconsecrated. There's an altar in Carrara's marble, and that's the point of reference. So, you know, this church... Even if you do other things, this church, we must take into account that that's a church. So we can't do everything. So we need to pay attention. It's a special space because here, what do we do? We are always in a dialogue. And the other uh church is a church of uh communion with the two poles, with the altar. And the amben, so everything is mobile, everything is removable. But it's there's fine works by artist Alex Zoltmeyer, and we can do many things there. Also, for example, at Christmas night, at Christmas Eve, we held a dinner there after a mass with the children. But that's the church of the community. 
as I mentioned yesterday, the spiritualities of different groups can be enjoyed there. The groups using this church that is used almost every day of the week. So you can see that this hybridization is something very sensitive. So we always need uh, to be careful, but it helps and it also attracts those people who normally don't go to church. But this way you also uh, attract other people and uh, you put them in contact with the sacred. And in Germany, for us, this is a great chance and it's a great possibility to uh, live in the neighborhood and in society. Well, I have a question for uh, the uh, morning speakers who presented the position of the church is compared to the uh, urban environment, which they are. So the problem is the relationship between geometry and intention. So we assume the coincidence between the centrality, this geometrical centrality in the center of gravity of the uh, neighborhood and the social uh, political centeredness. While this behavior is saying that the church is central when it's at the center, probably this is not always the intention of the, ch the church authority or the uh, community. There might be some ecclesial uh, attitudes when, if you have a possibility, 10, 15, 20 minutes on foot, maybe a parish center is, it's better built, not surrounded by the houses, but but not uh, even at the edges, but let's say in a um, I mean, not concealed, but let's say in a more hidden position. So Probably some activities can be carried out better outside of the traffic of the centrality of the neighborhood. This is something that we said with Giorgio Martina before the conference, but I think it's my, it's even more important. So it's hard to imagine a church uh, surrounded by churches leads to a series of dysfunctions, of noises, of passages, of contamination if you want so it will be interesting to have some sources helping us so for example a case in the last congress organized by Esteban and published on the journal so a study uh, a study uh, carried out by Francesca Leto on uh, Vicenza in which the designers wanted the, the church in the middle, but the diocese wanted it outside at the end of a road on a hill so that the church would have been raised, would have been visible, but not, let's say, in the middle of the houses. So the need to have the church at the center came from the will of the designer. So that, so that wasn't a marginal role, but it was a more monumental role to put it on a hill. So it was more of landscape architecture, more relevant ones. So probably the source say that probably don't declare it, but we have a prejudice. We have the prejudice of saying that essential thing stays in the middle, but it's the problem of the altar if we uh, lower this, the scale. So when the documents say that the altar must be essential, so you shouldn't have uh, an algorithm with the... Uh, setting the centrality, but as a spatial centrality and emotional centrality. I wrote down some things, so I leave them, but I would like to summarize.
I want to be a bit schematic. The, con the council, the interactive processes that were quoted and uh, knowing that, and they were translated into relational arts. So the foundation of the council is the people of God, participation, celebrating and uh, uh, rolling around the altar. So not the clergy and the laity, but the only people of God. And this determines the single space without monarchic rituals. Interventions, as we used to say in the works of the earthquake, where our uh, adjustment uh, interventions, not local interventions or improvements. So the whole space must be involved and uh, the liturgic room becomes the place, the fundamental place of the celebrating assembly. So this is said by the architect. So these are the things that uh, concern our architects. So as far as our uh, modern criteria are concerned, they must be updated in documents of the uh, Italian Episcopal Church for new and ancient churches must be updated by drawing inspiration from the experience of church and neighborhood, which was called Ch Chiesa e Quartiere, the magazine Church and Neighborhood, because it had a dimension that went outside of the churches. So the Lercaro spirit, three uh, biggest learning, I would like. Uh, and I would add uh, Manfredini from Reggio Emilia and other artists. It's it, it, the spirit that we need to ignite again. But the problem of us, the architects, when we talk about the calls, is this one. So, and I no longer see uh, Father Franceschini. And probably better because I'm saying things that I was concerned about saying. So, and talking about the call for tenders with the architects, when we do them, we always hope to win them. I dare you to say that, uh, to say the contrary. But to win them, the centrality of the altar is not the one that Andrea Longhi says, but it must be the centrality of the altar. Because if we do something, as Matisse said, then we end up like Matisse who was criticized because the altar was put there not by chance and so on and so forth. So, as far as we are concerned today we need to experiment some adjustments of liturgical and uh, celebra celebratory, non celebratory spaces, as we said today, with some hybrid uh, pers uh, perspectives. So, uh, libraries, uh, clothes, uh, other places like Hildebrand uh, Gerrit and Professor Grieco said, we, the architects, are also people of liturgy, as Grillo and Valenciano said in their wonderful book. So we need to support beautiful ideas. So the, the Holy Week at the theater is great, it's wonderful, but you always need our contribution. We are architects with the spirit, like an architecture in a 17th uh, century uh, complex of San Girolamo in uh, Reggio Emilia, where an architect of the 17th century was tasked with translating into architecture the Passion of Christ. So that's incredible. You can see that we can do things that apparently might seem absurd. And with the architects, in uh, other forms of liturgy involving the young people, but we need architects. And therefore, I'm pleased today I found myself here at this conference where there are many PhD students and newly PhD uh, PH doctors. So I am uh, I feel very old because there are very many young scholars. So thank you very much, Luigi, and the others because you've organized a wonderful two-day event. I'm very happy. So the... Uh, Adjustment of non-liturgical offices like the places of worship, starting from the road, the neighborhood with inside the courtyards. And in town centers, we also have structures and some gardens, some courtyards, some cloisters that are supposed to be uh, visited by the people and then they should be open and redesigned. But the problem of architects, once again, 
as Gareth said, and uh, also Professor Giannetti said yesterday, is move the space. So different liturgies must be dynamic. We've always been told during the Second Vatican Council. So think about provisional changes, moving the benches, removing them. Well, uh, in Easter Eve, Andrea Grillo said, let's burn them all benches burnt to make a fire so we can create new spaces for uh, prolonged uses we can give space to young musicians as it happened in a church for the whole holy week from germany they came and they easter week they were welcomed in the choir of a church during the easter week with open doors so that people passing by would hear the uh, rehearsal of these musicians, musicians and that, who then from uh, midnight to 1 a.m. were used to do a peace prayer with their own music. And, and we need that. So architects, it's very beautiful to work in the small chapel in the small communities because in this way we can make experience. So because the churches that we've seen, they are always massive uh, churches of four, 400, 500, 600 people that have very problem in litur liturgies with the benches. So the, the problem of the misproportion and the reduction of the laity and uh, then we are told uh, the churches are much, the uh, secular people, the laity are just a few. That's not the problem, but it's not a problem of a few priests. That's great. So the architects thinking the uh, architecture from the altar to the city. So not from the spoon to the city, but from the uh, uh, altar to the city. We need many uh, passion. We need a lot of passion, said Gisleri. So artists, architects, uh, uh, urban planners, landscape architect, uh, architects, uh, priests, uh, and everything. everything. It's bringing to put in together inside and outside spaces. The city with a soul, uh, Del Caro said, made of energy community, a dream. So the church, as a guest in the neighborhood, everybody going by bike with many uh, celebrations and with many citizens. Thank you. Congratulations on all the speakers. Uh, these have been two very intense and interesting days. I would like to reconnect to what Andrea said on the positioning of the church. I think this is a very interesting topic. And we have some examples of a positioning of the church in uh, which is not at the center of the church and is decided in Sardinia. I think about the Cagliari, the St. Paul Church is at the end of Long Avenue. Uh, Viale Dante, which is long 1.5 kilometers. So it was planned to be uh, built at the background. So the religious at the background of the urban fabric came from a revision that happened in the 1920s and 30s, where in many newly foundation cities are built with this dynamic, like ones in Sardinia, but also the one other in uh, Lazio region, like Aprilia Sabaudia, where the church conforms with this uh, uh, background idea when you have a niche with a main uh, main door uh, that goes beyond the perspective. So it's a, stra it's a very refined strategy of building the urban environment uh, studied by Guidoni, which has deeply roots, deep roots in the uh, medieval and, re and renaissance uh, way of building a city. So there are architects that are urban planners that are very careful to these strategies in history, in history that Resume that in this uh, in this year. So Sassari, because I know Sardinia best, has this example. So I'm studying it right now. And they're very fascinating because they tell about a very different urban dynamics compared to the sacred spaces. So that's, yeah, we need to research this topic more. And last one, I think, because, but we can go on, on the after, in the afternoon. 
Just a couple of quick questions. So I wanted to ask to Lorenzo Greco whether this, his study on Anglican Church brings him to say that the solution of multipurpose uses can be retraceable here in Italy. And then I wanted to ask uh, to the Belgian scholars whether they uh, work on uh, magazines, in this case, uh, modern churches is also made in the perspective of a potential of their reuse uh, in the strategic plans that the municipalities uh, must uh, uh, sign in the Flanders region. On the application of this model to Italy, I don't know because the British society is completely different and it has more pragmatic aspects. So the idea of optimizing uh, maintenance to optimize uh, uh, building costs is much closer to to the liberal society in general, the Anglo-Saxon world rather than ours. Probably uh, the idea of saving money on a, on uh, a church might seem blasphemy to us, uh, so not having to make the most of it in all our spaces. So I believe Oh, it wasn't very evident from my presentation, but these spaces didn't have a long life. The church that I talked about more extensively was demolished in 2008. The other ecumenic interprofessional centers, the shared centers, had a quite discontinuous use, inconsistent use, which was uh, far from the Schengen ideas which were uh, created with, because one of the community appropriated more the liturgical space, the other had some uncomfortable uh, times. So, so it's a concept that has sound basis. There is a heated debate, but then it has great limits in its application. And this is what happens all day. So I don't know whether that's applicable to the Italian context, but probably others can uh, answer better than me question. Uh, yes, um, of course, this uh, study of periodicals is for us a very important part within our research because um, we believe that to um, implement like um, uh, good um, adaptive reuse practices within the future of these post-war buildings, it is important to go back to the historical meaning of these materials, like how were they developed, who contributed to these, um, the building, uh, the building of these church buildings. Um, because like yeah, to take in to take into account history, um, we can all we can we have to start from that, like to discuss like how what the future of these buildings uh, involves, and um, yeah, what their heritage values is, because let's often um, in case of the post-war uh, churches in uh, Belgium, uh, they are often a bit uh, discarded as lesser value than the older churches. Um, but to us, yeah, it's really important then to establish them from a historical point of view, their values to like take them uh, with us uh, when uh, we try to assess like their um, potential within the future. Okay, you will keep... Okay, so I will conclude here. Now then in the afternoon, might have some more time with the guests uh, seated here. So I think it's lunchtime, one hour, and see you again here at uh, 2.45 uh, to go on with the third session. Thank you very much. People speak on the, uh, sleep on the afternoon. So, you know, you're not gonna sleep, you know, uh, starting again in the afternoon is always quite hard, but you know, we can do it. Come on. And I also wanted to tell you a couple of things. The first thing being is after uh, visiting uh, the Massimo Piana's. Uh, gallery. Uh, Massimo Piana gave us s just small books that tell the history of 
this building's gallery now and you know you can this is one for everyone and you Uh, second point of housekeeping, uh, the afternoon session will end with a debate like there was this morning, at the end of which you, you will not leave because there's going to be a toast, a final toast, as we say in it, as we say in Italy, uh, all saints and in glory, and since we're talking about churches you know of course we're going to have a final toast so it's important to stay slightly longer to uh, say goodbye to each other so i leave the floor to uh, this afternoon session uh, moderator who's a uh, someone that will be the curator of the magazine history of post-war architecture that and he will also sort of construct a monography of um, today's topics. And as he showed today, and he also gave a wonderful uh, uh, contribution in uh, uh, selecting the many abstracts that we received. So I leave the floor to uh, Professor Andrea Longhi, and I uh, thank him so much from the Politecnico di Torino. Thank you. These have been quite dense and long days, but really interesting. The first day I said that I was really curious about uh, listening to all the speeches and I must say I was uh, repaid in terms of everything we've touched on. But we still have Three final relation, the uh, final speeches, uh, international speeches. I must say, international international speakers. But uh, Calderoni Amabile's uh, uh, Calderoni Amabile won't be here today. Sometimes those closer to us are actually those who are going to renounce. But it's quite common in Italian conferences. Italy is beautiful for many things, though. Joao Alves uh, da Cunha. Uh, a scholar uh, well known in European discussion uh, about church building uh, and relation between uh, liturgy, society, and architectural culture. He has a degree in architecture and urban planning, University of Lisbon then a master in rehabilitation, but mainly his field of investigation uh, was cultivated in the PhD in architecture theory and history about the movement or renovation of religious art uh, during 20th century, in particular the Mrar, the movement he will talk about in his speech. And so, please, uh, Joao, you can join. Uh... So, half an hour, you know? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> I want to start. Thank you all for being here. I hope to keep you awake. It's not easy at this time. So I want to start thanking the, the organization for the opportunity, especially Giovanni Bellucci for the, the invitation. Um, as you can see, I'm going to speak in English. My English is not as good as the Belgian colleagues and after lunch is even worse, but the alternative would be Portuguese. I don't think we want that. Um, I'm going to speak about the subject of my PhD, uh, the Portuguese Religious Art Renovation Movement. It's a long name, so uh, I'm going to keep it short and say it, Mrar, 
Every time you hear me say Mujar, I'm speaking about the Portuguese religious art renovation movement. Um, I'm going to try to speak about four uh, things essential uh, in, in this 30 minutes, right? Um, first, uh, so four ideas. Why the Mughar was created? What the founders of Mughar thought it should be? Third thing, uh, what was in fact Mughar? What did he do? And uh, in the last but not least, uh, how Mughar changed the church architecture in Portugal? Uh, in order to answer the first question, why Mughar uh, was created, uh, we have to go back 50 years, okay, to the start of the 20th century in Portugal. At the time, the, the Portuguese religious architecture was mostly a revival one, uh, new Gothic architecture, new Roman uh, revival. Uh, that was uh, the kind of architecture uh, that was built uh, in the first decade. Um, two examples, uh, a church in, the, in a hospital near uh, Lisbon and uh, a church uh, in Lisbon, uh, in there in this uh, uh, sentence, it says the new church of angels. So it's not new, it's a revival, a neoclassic church. We are in 1910. In 1910 in Portugal, there was the implementation of the Republic. This meant to the church that uh, it was forbidden. It was expelled. Uh, uh, church, Catholic church specifically was forbidden to build new churches. So we have, a, right now we have a, a blank space in church building in Portugal. This first Republic that lasts about uh, 16 years was uh, chaotic time in Portugal. Uh, many politicians were murdered, was a chaos politically, economically, socially. So it's a very uh, confusing times. So confusing that in 1926, uh, 1926 uh, 26, exactly, the military did a coup in uh, May 28 to stop this uh, political <laughs> regime. And this led uh, quickly to the new state uh, that was formally instated in 1933. The state in Portugal means the uh, dictatorship times, okay? But also in the, what uh, matters to us, the architecture, the subject, new state meant also uh, trying to do things different than what was before. And uh, they decided exactly to use architecture to represented the come with something new. So they promoted a lot the modernist architecture. Uh, these are some examples of uh, architecture promoted by the, the, the new state. Uh, Radio Pavilion in the Institute of Oncology in Lisbon, a school in Beja, this is south of Portugal, uh, the Superior School of Engineering in, in Lisbon that was made by this architect, Perdão Monteiro, that's an important person in this story, that also does, he is going to do a lot of work in this time, the National Institute of Statistics. So we can see that it is a completely different type of architecture that was in the first decade. Uh, this uh, architect, Perdão Monteiro, was a, a person of interest to, to the regime. So. Uh, we have to say that uh, one of the things that uh, the, this regime also did was uh, to have a new relationship with the uh, Catholic Church. So uh, slowly it was allowed to come back and start building churches. Uh, but before building churches, uh, the cardinal had to have priests. They, he needed priests because they were expelled from Portugal in 1910. So to have priests, you have to build a seminar, and he divided Perdomontari to build the Diocese of Lisbon Seminar, exactly in the same 
type of architecture that he did in schools and in the Statistics Institute. Um, this seminar was uh, very much praised. It was published in 1934 in the French magazine Architecture de Jouy as the uh, church that was he was invited to do uh, right after the church of uh, Our Lady of Fatima, also published in 1939, one year after it opened to the public, 1938. This church uh, represents a lot to this uh, uh, Portuguese church architecture because it's, it represents uh, another change of times. For the Cardinal Sergeira, uh, at the left in the photograph, uh, it meant uh, it represented the type of church that, that he, he, he wished for his diocese. So he, he wrote a letter. Uh, that he spoke uh, about uh, three things that he wanted in the church, and he said that this church had all of them. Uh, to be a church, of course, <laughs> evident. To be a modern church, and a beautiful modern church. Uh, let's not talk about the church and the beautiful, let's uh, talk about the modern, what the cardinal uh, understood that was a modern church. As to be modern, we don't even understand that it could be something else. All artistic forms of the past were modern in relation to their time. Church of our days, we was speaking in 1939, but I think it, it would apply to our, to our times also. Church of our days should translate expressions of technique and contemporary art. Copy blindly artistic forms from other times. It will be to do artistic archaeology works, but it's surely not a living work of art. That was the, what happened before. So we could think that everything was okay. The cardinal, the principal cardinal in Portugal uh, uh, was a, a promoter of the, the, this type of uh, modern, modernist architecture. But no, we, are, we were ending the decade and the, the winds started to change. What do I mean by that? But before, let's just say that this church in 1938 won the, the principal award uh, given by the Lisbon City Hall. It is Premio Valmor. You will hear me talk about this prize two more times in this presentation. In 1938, this church won, won the award. But in 1939, uh, as I said, uh, the winds started to change. And this Tomás Ribeiro do Colasso wrote a lead that uh, uh, fight against this type of architecture and wrote a noble letter to the cardinal, where he said, where uh, the world wall, the wall of Lisbon is confessing shortly that the new church is very ugly, but no one says it loud for fear to displease your eminence. The new church is ugly, very ugly. And to show that she is ugly, just prove that it is lacking the characteristics that would be essential to its beauty. Portuguesism, it is completely absent from the new church. So we are changing from idea of uh, somewhat global architecture, international architecture, to some architecture that should be uh, national, Portuguesism. In 1940, one year after, the winds completely changed. Uh, the wall, wall, there was a world war. Uh, everyone was fighting, but not Portugal. We were having a Portuguese world exhibition to celebrate the big empire, the big Portuguese conquests, and the, the very, how good we are, the Portuguese. So this was the new idea of the regime. And it had to be a consequence in architecture. So this architect, Cristino, Cristino da Silva, was uh, uh, asked by the regime to do something completely different, to produce uh, a square in Lisbon, this area square, in the, it was a new neighborhood that was being built in Lisbon, and design what should be this Portuguese architecture. Uh, and this was this photo represents the, what uh, he made, and this image started to be uh, 
imposed to architects in Portugal. For you to see that I'm not exaggerating, uh, in 1945, the winner of the award, of this Lisbon award, was these uh, buildings, habitational buildings in, in Lisbon. So completely different. Uh, so seven years later, uh, after the, the church of Our Lady of Fatima, this is the winner. So completely uh, a new uh, idea. And the church again had to follow uh, these changes. I'm going to focus on three churches because they are the key churches to the start of Murrar. There are three churches built in Lisbon, 1951, Santo Constável, São João de Deus in 53, and São João de Brito in 55. This architect, young architect at the time, Nuno Titano Pereira, was one of the two founders of Mejar, called these three churches irreparable errors, because irreparable mistakes are all failed architectural works. He was speaking about these three churches. The, these three churches will be a testimony of the tremendous artistic disorientation of our time. It's funny, he said this in 53. It's, it's almost like 10 years again, 10 years later, the winds are changing again. And it's true, it happened. Um, to Tony Pereira already a few years uh, before in 47, he already wrote about this problem in an article called Contemporary Christian Architecture, where he wrote that it is necessary to speak openly. In this field of architecture, the present situation of our country provides a very sad overview. Religious architecture suffers from the same terrible evil as civil architecture, lack of authenticity. It's interesting how the perspective changes. In the same article, he, he says this very important thing. It's, uh, for me, it's the, the, key, uh, uh, the key motivation that led to, to the start of Mujar. He said it, it was important for someone in Portugal to go and see in person what was going on in Central Europe, what was going on already. The, the new churches were um, uh, appearing in Central Europe. It's not him, uh, not Tony Pereira, that, that does this trip, but João Almeida is the second person, uh, essential founder of the Mahar. Is the one that in 49 starts a three year, bill year trip to France, Switzerland, and Germany, where he meets the Dominicans of Sacre, the he, he works in the in the office of uh, Hermann Bauer, he, he goes to Germany and meets Schwartz. Uh, it's three uh, full time uh, years knowing the best of the best, let's put it this way. In 52, he returns to Lisbon, uh, full with a bag full of images, full of ideas, full of information. And when he shows the, this, all this information, one important uh, thing uh, for those that uh, don't know the political regime of Portugal at that time, it was not easy to, to go abroad, uh, to travel abroad, okay? And get information of what was happening outside. So this is, was almost a, a ray of light, okay? When you, when you come back with this information, uh, they said, uh, and when I say they, it's this, a group of young architects, uh, like Tony Pereira, João de Almeida, and uh, a few others. In the present circumstance, the present circumstance is having this uh, much information to remain silent would be to betray our vocation as architects and Catholics. So they decide to do an exhibition of contemporary religious architecture in Lisbon uh, because they were protesting about the, the state of things. Uh, I'm going to move forward. What they wanted was a clarification a clarification action and review of concepts so that the architecture can show today world, today's world the true face of the Church of Christ. This kind of, was kind of a mission for them. 
let's just say that the the exhibition was a new success. It was an, an it had an impact that none of them imagined uh, it would uh, uh, happen. And so they decided uh, after the, this exhibition to found Merar, Movimento de Renovação da Arte Religiosa, my Portuguese moment. Um, what did they imagine that Merar was supposed to do, to be? In the statues, they wrote that uh, Mahar was a Catholic community of artists and other interested people. This may be one of the secrets of the success of the Mahar. I said previously that the, the organizers of the architecture was a group of young architects. And they understood that this would only have impact if they opened that group. So uh, they opened, of, of, uh, it was open to artists, of course, but to art, artists, liturgists, priests, anyone, historians, anyone interested in the, the subject could join Bihar, and they did. Um, what they wanted to do to create internal study activities, World meetings of spiritual nature to develop its own members, to organize exhibitions, courses, conferences, uh, edit publications, to give opinion on all matters related to religious art, fight against commercialization of so called religious articles, and promote competitions. This was uh, is ambitious program. What did they in fact do? In terms of personal formation for, so for the inner group, they did monthly group meetings. This is a drawing of one of those meetings. They did uh, one uh, every year, a study meeting about one subject. So this was an internal formation of Mahar. They attended conferences, uh, even they were here in Bologna in 55, for instance. At, uh, at the right, we see a conference of Cardiol Carol in Lisbon with two of the members of Mahar. Uh, in the center, Dioglin Pimentel, that is a person of interest for Bologna because he worked here in 1959, in 1960, with Glauco Grasleri, and he uh, um, he brought that experience to, to Lisbon, the experience of uh, with the Grace Larry. They did a lot of readings. They had, they had completely complete uh, uh, the, all the numbers of all these magazines in the in the um, drawings uh, in their offices. They visit the the, the churches that were being built. Uh, uh, at least one, at left one of Schwartz and at right Ranchon. Um, but they didn't want to keep this formation for themselves. So they tried to, to inform uh, the other people. Um, so the first thing they had a, an, a successful exhibition and that exhibition uh, became itinerary. itinerary. So it went to, uh, to visit all, all many cities in Portugal they did uh, another ex other exhibitions. They uh, asked artists to do Christmas cards. They uh, had a, a bulletin. Uh, they gave many interviews to newspapers. They had a good, very good relation with the, with the media, with Portuguese media. They did a lot of conferences. Uh, they asked uh, people to do conferences. Uh, they had meetings with university students. They had uh, the... Um, a very care for the formation of the university students. Um, they did a sacred architecture course, and they also did uh, the competitions they wanted to, to, to do, uh, circuit art competitions and architectural competitions. From one of these, the, the one in the left in the Lisbon, uh, the, the, the one in the left gave, gave origin to the most iconic church of Mahar. 
the Church of Sacred Heart of Jesus in Lisbon uh, by Nuno Teutoni Pereira and Nuno Portas to, to Nuno's. Uh, this was the, the most is the most known uh, church uh, related to Mahar. Uh, it was a church that received the award by the city hall. And in 2010, it became the first Portuguese uh, church of the 20th century, 20th century to become a national monument. I think it's the, the only one until now. It's this, this church. The funny thing is that uh, when they started in 1953, they had no idea of what a modern church should be. This is true. And they said it in this exhibition. Uh, they said, we have no, they said a critic of, the, of those, reviv those, those Portuguese architectural churches, but they said they don't intend to solve that problem. They just want to debate the problem because they, don't, they didn't have the, the actual solution. In the first three, four years, they uh, present three possible solutions. One is from João de Almeida. It's a church of St. Anthony. It's uh, in the border of Lisbon. It's a, a church uh, much uh, inspired by the Swiss architecture. The, sex, the second one is by Nuno Tritorno Pereira. It's a, a church of Our Lady of Fatima, very far from Lisbon that uh, tries to synthesize the modern architecture with the traditional Portuguese architecture. And the third example that, that they showed was uh, almost a pure uh, modern church, what could be a pure modern church, ch the Chapel of Lady in Fatima. So co three completely different churches. By this time, the Portuguese Architects Association was doing a survey of the popular architecture in Portugal. And it is in this process, uh, Portuguese architecture uh, rediscovered the, uh, the, the qualities and the, uh, the richness of the, the Portuguese different types of architecture because the north is very different from the south and the center and et cetera. But this, this idea of the, 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 the traditional architecture was something that became very much present. So the, the, the members of Mujar uh, decided to choose one type of this, and it was this one. It was the, 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 uh, the solution that combined modernity with tradition. It was exactly the one from Nun to Tony Pereira. And so in the first projects that these architects were asked to do, uh, this is a commentary uh, by Albino Clet, that was a, a future uh, Portuguese bishop that uh, about this church, that uh, it was one of the most valid solutions that modern Portuguese sacred architecture gave us until today. So as I was saying, when they started, were invited to, to do uh, uh, churches all over the country, they uh, started to do exactly this way, modernity combined with tradition. Uh, some examples, this is in the south of Portugal, this is in, this is in the north of Portugal, this is in, in the center, um, this is all, again in the north, um, in Aveiro, uh, near Porto, in Fatima, in the center of Portugal. And I, uh, what do I highlight? What was the key idea? Integration. Integration meaning what? Uh, the need to relate the expression of a home or a church with the concrete conditionism of the place, relation with the place and the people of the place. What does this mean in architecture? Uh, I think these three churches of the same architecture, Luis Cunha is a, uh, a member of Mujar. Then almost in the same years, 65, 65, 68, uh, show exactly what this means. Uh, three completely different contexts and so uh, three completely different churches. Mahar was not an architectural office. Uh, this is uh, important to say. 
but it's easy to say that, uh, to, to understand that these architects uh, spent a lot of time together. They uh, showed their projects to, to each other and they criticize a lot uh, it's every project of one another. With this process, somewhat, somehow, a family uh, of architectural family ap appeared, the Mahar family architecture. And a somehow familiar type of architecture, architecture appeared when they start building uh, bigger churches. Um, João de Almeida near Lisbon, Titano Pereira uh, in, in a town uh, south of Lisbon, Santiago, this one uh, in the center of Lisbon, uh, also in near Lisbon, Calouche, uh, in Porto. So this created in the, in the 60s a kind of a family of churches. These man, this many churches, because there, there, there were uh, many, were supposed to be published in the Chiesia Quartieri mag magazine in 69. Unfortunately, the magazine uh, ended before it. So the benefit from that ending was the Spanish Ara, Art Religioso Atual, that received all the material that was prepared for that publication and that uh, prove that uh, Mahar effectively changed things. And uh, in a way that uh, uh, in 65, Dioglin Pimentel says that they were in a new phase uh, in Portugal that was no longer controversy for accepting uh, modern architecture. Let's say, let's show this in numbers. Let me see my notes so I don't lie to you. This represents the churches built in the decade of 50s in Lisbon, the diocese of Lisbon, okay? There were 21 churches, 17 were built in a national style, okay? Just for try to be modern. Let's not talk about the quality of the modern. That's not the issue here. But four of them try to be more modern. And a curiosity, just one, Muscavid in 56, uh, was related to Mahar. This was the 50s. In the 60s, there were built 14 churches in the Lisbon diocese, all modern. And nine of them were directly related to Mahar. But this was not just in Lisbon. In the rest of the country, in the 60s, there were built 20 churches, okay? Nine of them, all modern, and nine of them directly related to Mahar. So it was uh, true to, to say, to Juan d'Almeida, to say in 67 that we won the battle, the double battle of functionality and the acceptance of modern art in churches. These are points that nobody discusses today. So in 69, there was a letter sent to all the Mahar members saying that different at this time, the group responsible proposes that Mahar be frozen until a new opportunity arises to return it to life. Its extinction is not proposed, but only the temporary suspension of, of its activities. Because the Mahar is all, at all times a resumable constitution if it is considered useful for the life of the church. It was not until today, so this was the end. And this is the end. Thank you. We are arriving to the final uh, intervention of the conference. Our last speaker is Kate Jordan. 
a senior lecturer in the School of Architecture and Cities at the University of Westminster in London. She has published widely on modern era faith architecture with recent publications on contemporary church architecture in many different journals. She also contributed a chapter on 19th century Catholic architecture in the recently published Oxford History of Catholicism in Britain and Ireland. And she co-edited the volume Architecture for Religious Communities, Building the Kingdom, published by Rutledge in 2018. The, the final topic of this conference uh, address uh, a topic that take us inside the churches. So we are passing through the neighborhood, uh, to the interior, the refurbishment of historic churches in their interior, because the topic will be the, I mean, the, the whitewashing uh, uh, movement, we can say, of the interiors of historical churches. We already, yesterday, we are about talking uh, this uh, white color inside the religious building. Uh, I, I think that the paper will, uh, will address uh, the problem if it is a social approach. Uh, I mean, what's really the meaning of this white in the term? It's not just a problem of refurbishment, of uh, restoration, but there is maybe a more deep approach to the problem of the spirituality in the interior of this kind of churches. Thank you for your proposal and for your paper. Um, I'm going to be presenting my paper in English, naturally. Uh, but first, in Italiano, grazie. La... Thank you so much uh, to the committee for selecting my article. And good afternoon to everyone. In this paper, I want to explore the significance of whiteness in the interior refurbishment of historic churches in London, you can see one here. Is that better? I suggest that there is an observable trend for interior designs that employ whiteness thematically, often involving the painting over of colorful schemes and the removal of artworks. Though my work has focused on London, I've also visited a number of sites in the UK and also some in Europe, and I suspect that the points I'm going to be making can be extrapolated fairly widely. To examine this trend, I've refined my research to focus on three recently refurbished historic churches in London, which you can see here. Two are from the Anglican Communion and one Roman Catholic. I'll use these examples to investigate the claim made by the architectural theorist and priest, Peter Newby, about white minimal churches. I'm going to paraphrase him. He says, the modern architectural desire for spiritual space lacks visual imagery and therefore, and to a direct quote, raises the question whether such interiors may be described as Christian spaces. Newby discusses this in specific relation to one of the following case studies that I'll be looking at, um, St. Augustine's Hammersmith, which you can see there. But his points apply equally to my other case studies, St. John at Hackney and St. John's Waterloo. I want to start then by thinking about what Newby means when he suggests that such interiors might be considered spiritual rather than properly Christian spaces, which is a very bold claim to suggest that these aren't properly Christian spaces really stands out to me. In his article, Imminence and Immersion, published in 2018, Newby makes the distinction between Christian and spiritual spaces. 
arguing that the latter has become increasingly prominent in recent years. In doing so, Newby does not discuss whiteness separately from minimalism. Rather, he conflates the two in what he calls, to quote him, imageless and cool spaces. Newby's observations about churches such as August St. Augustine's reflect my own. I've been increasingly interested in the theological significance of whiteness in contemporary church architecture and the extent to which, as Newby suggests, this gestures towards spirituality as a category that is distinct from religion. White purpose-built churches abound, not just in the UK, but across the world, as you can see from all of these examples. And I think uh, some of you saw an example very similar to this last night. This, I think, is an ecumenical cross-disciplinary trend, and it does certainly deserve uh, closer attention. What interests me more, however, particularly for this conference, is the act of transforming historical churches into spaces that overlay new cultures of worship onto traditional ones. Of course, churches, like all buildings, are dynamic. Here is St. Mel's in Longford, Ireland, which underwent uh, a recently completed major restoration following a fire in 2009. Over time, churches such as St. Mel's are added to, edited, refurbished, restored, and adapted. The superimposition of different aesthetic styles, cultures, and rituals characterizes historic churches. We're all familiar with the fact that historic churches have accreted over time and, and different styles have been imposed on the spaces. In the case studies I'll be discussing, I will be exploring earlier refurbishments and design schemes. It's impossible to look at historic churches without considering the different phases. And each historical phase of a church's life can be read in meaningful ways. So, for example, the iconoclastic whitewashing of medieval churches tells us a great deal not only about the Protestant Reformation, but also about the social and political turmoil of the 16th and 17th centuries. In just the same way, I will argue that whiteness tells us something about the particular conditions of the 21st century, certainly in Western Europe and the Anglophone world and possibly beyond. So with that in mind, the first example that I'd like to look at is the refurbishment of St. Augustine's Hammersmith in London, which was completed in 2018. The objective of this scheme, which was a collaboration between Ros Bar architects and parish priest, Father Gianni Notariani, was to strip away the veneers of paint, creosote and carpeting to reveal the raw materials of the church. The relationship between space and symbolism is explicit as the architect Rose Barr states, and I'm going to quote her. She says, there is an honesty to our approach that aims to celebrate this urban room. Urban room, I think, is a rather odd way of describing a church, uh, and create a more optimistic and purer interior. The church, which was built between 1915 and 16, was founded by Augustinian priors and continues to be served by the order from the neighboring priory. The original building is a solid, but relatively undistinguished example of early 20th century neo-Romanesque. That's typical of its era. The intervening years saw the interior decorated and redecorated in a sequence of styles. By the time the current refurbishment commenced, a total of six layers of paint had been applied to every surface, including the stone piers. As you can see here, the roof timbers were stained dark brown and the internal color scheme was dominated by the sky blue apse and the red carpeted chancel floor. In 2012, Father Natariani secured funds to begin the first phase of a major redevelopment of the site and Rosbar architects were appointed to undertake the work. 
beginning with a significant overhaul of the interior. The most striking element um, of the refurbishment, as you can see, has been the introduction of light into the base by stripping the roof timbers and treating them with white oil to create a unified pale color scheme. The limestone columns and timber floors have also been stripped and sealed. The intention here was to create a rationalized, readable space that generates a sense of unmediated spirituality. And importantly, when I asked the architect how she had interpreted the brief, she emphasized that she wasn't religious herself. In fact, she described herself as an atheist, um, but said that she had wanted to capture her own sense of spirituality. And that is a sentiment that reflects quite a lot of conversations that I've had with architects working on churches. This was not at odds with the objectives of Father Notariani, who was, um, a, a, he had a, a background as an artist. He was actually a, um, a, an alumnus of the Slade, which is one of the UK's top art schools. And indeed, the aesthetic vision for St. Augustine's is a genuine collaboration between Father Notariani and Ros Barr. And so, as you can see, really starkly white in comparison to the way that it used to look. Similarly, the refurbishment of St. John at Hackney, also in London, brought together the vision of the new rector with the architect responsible for the interior design scheme, John Pawson. The six million pound refurbishment of this grade two star listed church saw much of the interior stripped out and the walls painted white. The church, which was originally built in 1794 to designs by James Spiller, had been remodeled in the 1950s by the noted church architect N.F. Cashmail Day to include a Festival of Britain style color scheme and fittings. And Lorenzo Greco might, might well know Cashmail Day's work. A, a very significant Anglican architect of uh, the, the interwar era. In 2017, the newly appointed um, rector, Al Gordon, decided to bring the interior of the church up to date and introduce some architectural prestige. He engaged John Pawson, who I'm sure you all know, known for his minimalism and fondness for white, to redesign the scheme. This is Pawson's only church in the UK, so it does have some considerable cachet. Uh, and though it's a, a relatively undistinguished 18th century church, it now draws quite a lot of visitors. The result, as you can see, has much in common, there it is, uh, with Pawson's austere refurbishment of the Moritz Kirche in Augsburg, which was rebuilt in 1946 by Dominicus Byrne and remodeled internally successively over the 20th century. Uh, finally, as you can see here by John Pawson. The Moritz Kirche refurbishment involved, in Pawson's words, and I'll quote him, the meticulous pairing away of selected elements of the church's complex fabric. In much the same way that elements were paired away at St. John at Hackney. The completed scheme has been widely praised for its sophisticated and sensitive white aesthetic. And it's highly photogenic, as you can see. Let's just go back. Um, I was quite surprised to learn that the complete removal of the Cashmere Day fittings, the 1950s fittings, um, met with little objection from heritage bodies, including the statutory consulty, the 20th Century Society. So the 20th Century Society, for those people who don't know, is a, an amenity society which has to be consulted by law when any changes are made to churches. So the Cashmel Day fittings, which were quite significant, were removed without any complaint, possibly because this was a John Pawson uh, refurbishment and nobody wanted to miss the opportunity to have a John Pawson church in the UK. The painting over of the original design scheme and the removal of the 1950s fittings to ostensibly evoke the original spirit of the church, to ostensibly generate a sense of the uh, 18th century Georgian low church spirit of the church, 
it had much in common with my final example, which is St. John's Waterloo. Here, the alterations to the interior did prove to be more controversial. And although the scheme is overwhelmingly white and largely minimal, it's certainly not as austere as either the architect or the rector wished. And the compromises that were finally reached were the result of a campaign to save the 1950s interior design scheme. So the original Greek revival building uh, designed by Francis Octavius Bedford in 1824, was one of four churches in Southwark in London built to celebrate the end of the Napoleonic Wars. St. John's underwent a series of subsequent renovations, first by Reginald Blomfield in 1885, then by John Ennian Comper in 1924, and finally, following significant bomb damage during the Blitz, by the Southern, Southwark diocesan architect Thomas Ford in 1950. The 1950 refurbishment, which you can see here, alongside the uh, on the top left, the the uh, Eric Parry White um, refurbishment. The 1950 refurbishment saw a new Greek-inspired decorative scheme: the creation of two chapels, a lectern, altar, and what was called a double-decker pulpit. It also saw the installation of a mural by the artist Hans Feibusch. Um, whose work appears in many of Ford's churches. It's the, the, the Feibusch mural is the one in the center um, above the altar. St. John's was designated the official Festival of Britain Church in 1951, a move that conferred a seal of approval on the interior design and established its historical significance. Indeed, the current listing description focuses equally on the original building and the 1950s interior. And I, I really would like to emphasize here, as I'm sure you all know, that interiors are absolutely as important in churches as exteriors. And it was the remodeled 1950s interior that was considered perhaps most significant about this church. In 2015, the diocese agreed that the church needed to be updated to meet its growing needs as both a place of worship and a concert venue. Uh, as with many churches, large churches in London, this operates like St. John at Hackney as a concert venue when it's not being a church. Uh, and they engaged Eric Parry Architects, very, very significant architectural practice in London, uh, also noted for their award-winning refurbishment of St. Martin in the Fields, again, a very significant early 18th century church. The practice drew up radical plans that would see most of the 1950s interior stripped out, bear in mind again that it's the interior that's part of the listing of this church. The two chapels were to be removed and new galleries constructed either side of the nave, replacing, replacing those that had been lost in Thomas Ford's remodeling. In addition to this, the 1950s fittings and artwork were to be removed with only the Firebush mural being retained. The plans were challenged by the 20th Century Society, the Immunity Society, who felt that Thomas Ford's decorative interior was central to the historic value of the church. Both the architect and vicar of St. John's, uh, Canon Giles Goddard, continued to defend the scheme and the dispute resulted in a consistory, consistory court hearing in 2016, which resulted in the Chancellor of the Diocese of Southwark upholding the 20th Century Society's objections. So the key things that the 20th Century Society objected to, um, which were the removal of the, the, the chapels, um, were that was upheld, but, there, but, but nevertheless, there's been some quite significant remodeling. So it's a compromise. Neither party was really particularly happy about it, um, but there it is. So the reworked plans were granted to faculty in 2018. Much of the original decorative scheme was lost, largely the, uh, the, the paintwork, including the murals either side of the reredos. The Festival of Britain color scheme was largely repainted white with some details picked out in pale gray and gold, as you can see on the top left. What all three of these examples have in common, as this paper emphasizes, is that white is used thematically in the interior design and in all cases replacing a colorful design scheme and also removing some of the artwork and fittings. 
One could reasonably argue that in the case of St John at Hackney and St John's Waterloo, the minimal white schemes restored the Georgian spirit of the original 18th century Protestant church. But that can't be said of St Augustine's and it can't be said of these examples of historic churches in the UK that have been similarly refurbished with a coat of white paint replacing muted color schemes. Here's St Matthew's and Bishop Brig in Scotland, an early example of the work of um, Gillespie, Kidd and Coyer, and on the right, St Mary's Church in Andover. And across Europe, here is the interior of a church which I, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce um, in Hungary, as you can see, uh, an extremely white refurbishment. In the case studies that I've looked at, the case studies that I've looked at raise some serious questions around changes in conservation practices. But they also say something about the visual culture of worship and how this has shifted in late modernity. Peter Newby sheds some interesting light on this in his reflections on St. Augustine's Hammersmith, and I'm going to quote him in full here because I think this is significant. So he describes St. Augustine's thus, quote, the interior of the church has been painted white and the roof beams have been bleached. The visual effect of so much white has been to re-emphasize the Romanesque architectural antecedents of the church, something that's been hidden behind the colored interior. The simplicity of forms and the coolness of the interior reaffirms the modern architectural desire for spiritual space. But the lack of visual imagery raises the question whether such interiors may be described as Christian space. So while Newby accepts that perhaps there is a, there, there was a, a context for painting St. Augustine's on the right here, uh, white, a historical context because it's a neo-Romanesque church. He also notes that whiteness represents something of the distinction between the spiritual and the religious. Much has been written on the historical significance of whiteness in churches over the years. Indeed, it's something that I've written on myself. But Peter Newby, as an architectural theorist and perhaps more importantly, a Catholic priest, offers perspectives that are, he offers invaluable insights into its theological basis. And I think that that's the, the significant thing here. It's not simply, I don't think, a fashion. I think that, that there is some theological basis for this. For Newby, a truly Christian space needs to immerse the worshipper in the act of prayer. He, suge he, su he suggests that, and I'll quote him in full here again, the Catholic Church has always placed an emphasis on visual imagery found in painting, but also on the enclosed spaces that allow for the celebration of sacraments. These two, along with music and words, create a full immersive experience that has narrative content. It is this something to say that becomes lost in imageless and cool spaces of so many contemporary, uh, so much contemporary religious architecture such as these. Every revealed religion does not simply illuminate the human condition. It also answers its questions, quells its fears and points towards its consummation." Unquote. Of course, it's important to note here that Newby is a Catholic priest discussing a Catholic church. But two of the examples that I've highlighted today, St. John at Hackney and St. John's Waterloo are Anglican. In both cases, they've undertaken similar refurbishments that literally whitewash elements of the church's long history. In both, the significant changes to the decor made during the Festival of Britain in the 1950s. This suggests to me that the trend for white interiors crosses denominations. It doesn't belong to one denomination or the other. And it speaks to a wider shift in both Anglican, Catholic, and indeed other mainstream churches in the UK. Of course, it's necessary to make a distinction between removing images and repainting original color schemes. Peter Newby doesn't dwell on whiteness itself. But none of these examples have been painted a different color. The act of bringing them into the 21st century has not simply involved the removal of visual imagery, 
it's also introduced whiteness in its place. For me, there's no reason why this couldn't have been any other color, significant that it's white. We could speculate a number of reasons for this, but the key, I think, is the distinction that Newby makes between the religious and the spiritual. The shift in late modernity towards the spiritual is something that's been documented by sociologists and historians of religion who argue that spirituality is increasingly understood as a category that is distinct from religion and experienced by people of all faiths and of none, importantly, spirituality, uh, and this is reflected by the architects of churches that I've spoken to who call themselves atheists, who also claim to have a sense of spirituality, um, have, have understood this term as being something quite different from religion. It might seem natural then that the welcoming church should embrace all visitors, worshiping or otherwise, and celebrate spirituality as a condition that's liberated from human cultures. Sociologists and theologians studying the growth of per personal spirituality and the decline of formal worship suggest that the rise of, to quote Grace Davy, believing without belonging, can be mapped onto the emergence of the consumer economy and self-ownership, or individualism, for want of a better term. Here, the interests of faith and secular communities have coincided to produce a religious marketplace in which churches must compete for worshippers who are accustomed to choice and to curate their own devotional practices, often cherry picking from a range of world religions and new age practices. So a little bit of everything. These non-partisan worshippers move easily between churches and tend to share a conviction that spirituality is universal. For such worshippers, the white church perhaps allows them to hang their own version of spirituality on the blank walls. And perhaps just as importantly, it provides a lingua franca that allows congregants across denominations and continents to understand one, one another. Perhaps this is a good thing. If the notion of a universal spirituality now characterizes late modern religion, then it might seem natural to reach for a spatial and aesthetic neutrality that everyone understands. Or perhaps white churches present us with some problems. Perhaps they signal, as Newby suggests, the cleansing of distinctive denominational visual cultures and the decline of immersive collective Christian worship. The loss, in Newby's words, of something to say. On this last point, however, I take a slightly different view. For me, this new chapter in the long history of whiteness in church architecture does have a great deal to say about tastes, practices, and beliefs in the 21st century. It's just a question of whether we like what it's saying. Thank you. Grazie. That's it. Thank you very much. So the official program ends here, but we have some space for for the debate. So I'm asking Luigi to come sharing the debate. Thank you, everybody. And I give the floor to Professor Bartolomei. Thank you very much for your patience because you've been here a long time. Afternoon sessions are always the hardest ones. We've dealt with many topics. And do we have any remarks, any inputs, any questions? Or let's say anything that comes out of the program. The program says conclusion, but I don't think that a conference like this can draw any kind of conclusion. So I think that we can try to start a discussion, a debate, which might go beyond the end of this uh, conference.
interesting also because we, I've discovered that we have a, a friend in common, Gianni Notarianni. Uh, <laughs> so when uh, I sent him a message, there is someone speaking about your church here in Bologna. And uh, no, the, the thing of white is, uh, I'm sorry that yesterday night you were not with us because uh, the church we visited was actually completely white. And, uh, but, uh, and of course, the John Paulson poetics, I think, is uh, very well known in, uh, uh, in Europe, also for the monastery in Czech Republic, he, he realized. There is uh, undoubtedly a way by means of which light has always meant something in uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, theology. Also from Severino Boezio uh, in, uh, up, to, up to now. And, but of course, the change, the conceivement of what light is, is completely different from the Middle Ages up to now. And uh, for, co for sure, this need of light it's also a wish, maybe, to be enlightened. We would like to be enlightened in a spiritual way. And uh, yes, I think this is my personal opinion that the fact that probably we do not say something precisely Christian by means of light, something connected with a specific theology, the theology of revelation, but we do say something which can be, which can, which can catch a person in its archaic, or uh, uh, if you want archetype, a perception of uh, the space. So it's more phenomenological. No, uh, once uh, we studied uh, um, in Jewish language, for example, the root of kadosh, kadosh kadeshim the saint of the saint in the Bible, uh, is supposed to be something which means uh, in its root something brilliant, something lightning. But also if you think of another term to say sacredness in the Bible, but also in the Greek gospels was agnus, agnus, agios, agnus. Agnus is the lamb. Nothing else is white as lamb when he is just born. So you mean that you immediately see that the category of light, of whitening, white, brilliant, even sparkling, is a, a matter of distinction, which is connected deeply with sacredness. And the category of sacredness is wider than the category of religion. And, uh, and there is also a book uh, in Italian, uh, an amazing book, very useful, but I think it's written only in Italian, uh, The Liturgy on the Proof of the Sacred, La Liturgia alla Prova del Sacro. Penso che qualcuno, Don Umberto, l'hai letto. So I think that Father Umberto, have you read it? It's a... By Paolo Tomatis, uh, an excellent book regarding this relationship on the other side, the research by Julio Bermudez, uh, of course, it's... Uh, so this is my reflection on a topic which uh, also... There is a distinction, of course, because in Italy, all uh, this uh, whitening, wash whitening is uh, forbidden because we have a, a superintendence. I proposed to make white here, but nobody said it was impossible. And so maybe we need more light here, but we cannot whiten <laughs> so, so thank you. No, extremely thank you. It was uh, really interesting. Sorry for my personal opinion on this topic. Uh, Lorenzo. Since there's a red microphone, so please take it. by Professor Jordan lessons as well, and it makes me think so many things. 
And uh, yeah, at first, thank you for showing the images of uh, John Putin's intervention. And I was thinking that if I'm not wrong, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was described as one of the ugliest church in Christendom. And now it is considered one of the most beautiful church in London. And so I probably there's a visual supremacy of color also on space that uh, is at the base of this change in the perception of the church. And then I had some question, reflection on probably the influence of black and white photography of architecture that was very strong also in England. If I think to the work of photographers like all the white buildings that were uh, portrayed by Idele and uh, Wainwright, if I'm not wrong. But I was also thinking to the liturgical function of the white color. And I was thinking to the work of Eric Gill. Eric Gill was a painter for the ones who do not know him. And he was a painter, but he was also a sculptor. And so he learned the lesson of Michelangelo, of the new sacristy of San Lorenzo in Florence, but also the lessons of some other sculptors and, arch and architects, like if I think to Antonio Gerardi, who is this stucco maker of the 17th century in Rome, who did an entire white chapel in uh, Santa Maria in Trastevere. And so uh, Eric decided to strip off all the wooden uh, wasserie of a chapel in the Blundell School in order to focus the attention on the altar and to make all the walls white in order to give a new importance to the altar that was an all around altar in the 1940s. And so I was thinking if the white can help to reorganize the liturgical foci of the space and if it is really working just to give, to let people know where to address their view, probably. And so I'm sorry for this confused uh, remark. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo, and thank you, Luigi, as well. Uh, just, just to start, I suppose, with my response. Can I, do you want me to stand up? Okay. To start with my response then to, to those points, firstly, I take your point and, and you know, over the 20th century as well, I take your point that white does clearly have a kind of scriptural uh, significance and it does have a religious significance. But my question, I suppose, is what it means now. Why now? What does it mean in this moment? So, yes, we can see something essential about it, but in each, in each kind of phase of the history of whiteness, and yes, we you look it into war um, churches and the... Um, the, the move away from uh, the neo-Gothic in, in, the, in the 20th century uh, and the introduction of white. Um, and then, you know, of course, we see examples of white elsewhere in, uh, across the 20th century liturgical movement, churches and so on. But, it, but it's this particular expression of white that I'm seeing now, and I'm wondering why it is. And I hope Jenny Notario <laughs> won't, won't, won't be too... Uh, well, I hope he'll take it in the in the um, if if I tell him in the spirit it was intended. Um, but your question about photography uh, is is correct. We often have a we often have a misunderstanding of what architecture looks like when it was photographed in black and white. So we we don't take into consideration often that Le Corbusier's work had a lot of color in it because we see it photographs of it in black and white. Um, and we, we don't get a sense very often from historical journals of what architecture looked like. We have a sense of white architecture that wasn't actually very accurate. Uh, yeah, I mean, how this relates to photography, I'll just finish quickly. <laughs> how this relates to photography, I think is very interesting because the photographs that I showed um, of all of the different white churches, most of which I haven't seen, have been taken from architects, um, uh, architects' own websites, and what they've done clearly is make their churches look whiter, as white as they possibly can. So that indicates that actually it's quite significant. It, you know, the fact that they have to look white and appear white and be as white as they possibly can, even if they're not actually that white in real life, uh, shows you firstly what photography can do, and secondly, the intention of the architect and the community that commissioned them. So, yeah, I don't know if that's answered your questions, but that's my. <laughs> my sense of the significance of whiteness. Thank you. Thank you. 
So it, there's also a white coming from the liturgical movement, and I think about Schwarz churches dominated by the white color. Even Guardini. The first white church was the Ritesal, the room of the knights in Rottenfeld. Because Schwarz wrote that, that the community and the framework and the Gestalt. And they wrote the image, the framework. And this is a huge task that the Noma community can do. And Schwarz also designed different churches, not white, and the colors with other materials, but What's ideal for Schwarz is the first church, Corpus Christi, in uh, Aachen with the white Christ. So that that frame and the white wall. So when you see that wall, when you celebrate, when Eucharist is celebrated, it's Christ coming from the east, and he comes from within. It's the same. I mean, it's white and light, and it's the light creating this image. It's spirituality. It's Christian spirituality of the Christian religion. So it's white as the color and the icon, and also spiritual as a eschatological projection, as an expression of sense. So this is an important difference. So this sense of iconicity was typical of some monastery uh, movements. I remember some monastery churches that are made of this white spaces. Are there other remarks? Tina, would you like to say something about white? Probably yes. Give me the microphone, please. I just wanted to say what uh, he said, what Albert said. Guardini says, white and white space is the image. And that's why one of the, one of the, that's one of the remarks from which I started in composing those images with the AI. It's not just white, but it starts from this idea. And the space is the image. So to overcome the idea that there is something applied justifying Christianity. In the Christendom of the space, as Albert says, it's an image. It's light and Christianity, and that's how we should interpret it. And I think this is the greatest conclusion. Yeah, we came, we went back to the origins. We went back to the uh, night's room in Rottenfeld, so it was quoted by today's speaker. So are there other remarks? Otherwise, I would close this symposium, this moment of common reflection. I would like to thank all the speakers, everybody who came from far away and those who came from Italy, from closer. And I leave you to a coffee break, which is also a final toast, a farewell toast. And everybody who spoke today and those who also received a positive feedback on the answer that they sent are invited to uh, submit a full papers, which will be uh, peer reviewed in blind peer reviewed. So, and then we will proceed to the uh, monographies, to the final publication, final books of this uh, symposium on history of post-war architecture for the uh, speeches around uh, a uh, historical research and 
with regards to the session that we had yesterday in Bor Ricerca e Progetti for the Territory, the City and Architecture. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Claudia Manenti told me that she is the director of the DS Domini Research Center. If the speakers would like to be uh, subscribed to the initiatives of the Lercaro Research Center. So if, whether she can contact you, if, if you can exchange the email with this uh, research center in Bologna, it's a newsletter from which you can uh, also unsubscribe. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much. That was a very great event. Let me thank uh, for Career Research Center Federica Folini, who followed the whole uh, thing. And in general, the cooperators of the INBO uh, Giorna Giulia Bocore did an exceptional work as, work as usual for the graphics of the conference and the group of these two com eventi that assisted us our days and on the other side of the room the interpreters Francesco Cecchi and Edoardo Vallerini. Thank you very much and thank you very much everybody for the great for your great job and have a great journey back home <laughs>